Good evening and welcome to another Faro Art Stream with myself, Faro. And uh, today we're going to be speaking to a very special guest, um, Fen. Welcome, welcome to the channel. Thank you so much, Faro. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's, it's a pleasure. Um, and can continuing what we were doing a couple of uh, weeks ago with um, Zachary Brown, uh, we're trying to kind of identify other interesting shining lights in the uh, in the art sphere and of course one, one cannot talk about um quality artistic work and also quite deep thinking without speaking about uh, without speaking about fen so um i had to i had to have you on now i i saw um our mutual friend stoutly counter signaling the intellectual nature of 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 fen that was out outrageous <laughs> and i would just like to say just as a personal chastisement to state any any man with a with a manifesto is is, a, is an intellect is an intellectual. So oh my god, well that's I mean that's extremely kind of you. But I um I mean I really just label myself as a sculptor. I uh, I, I I try to I, I try to stick within that realm. But indeed, you know the, there has to be some thinking along the way. So yeah, no ex ex exactly. And actually, maybe I think just as an aside, I think we need more, maybe a bit more thinking and a bit more work. <laughs> and a little less uh, politics, but anyway, let, let, let's let, let's get into it. Um, and Fen, I just wanted to start out by just kind of hearing a little bit about um, yourself and kind of where, where you've come from. And I, I guess uh, just to kind of talk about the story of my interaction with you, it was from it was like a random retweet. Maybe, maybe again, maybe it was Stoke that, that that did it initially. And yeah. Um, yeah. I think it was like maybe one of your kind of videos, just talking through. Um, kind of you, your work and how you kind of uh, made it and stuff, and, and I guess just instantly, um, it kind of if if anyone's seen has seen uh, Fen's work before, it's, uh, it's it stands out from the crowd both stylistically but also um, you know te technically, and and this is uh, it's interesting work, but it's also high high quality production, and um, you know this was like oh this is very this guy is very very in very very interesting. But I, I, I guess one thing I did notice then was that you've um, kind of like with your Instagram and your and your Twitter has kind of been active for like the last couple of years. Um, but kind of you you reference uh, you know uh, art art school and I, I guess kind of difficulties kind of cutting through there. It'd be great to kind of hear a little bit more about uh, your your kind of backstory and how how you've kind of got to this place. And also, yeah. like, how have you come to your your style? Because what I, what I want to know is, right? Why is there none of your art from art school that's 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 around there? Was it was it either very different to the stuff you're doing now, or uh, as with any good artist, have you set fire to all of your your uh, inf inferior works? This, this, that's my greatest fear. Is like, I I genuinely. <laughs> Any of my little doodles that are terrible, I literally go back from previous years and I will remove them and and, and burn them so people have a, a better idea. But anyway, I, over to you. What, like, well, I mean, actually, I um, to give you a, good, a general uh, background story. I mean, I a, a lot of the works that I've actually done during art school, um, I just haven't shared them, and I've I've been thinking about uh, actually doing a thread and just showing like some of the stuff that I was uh, going through. Um, and I think people will actually see that um, while I was studying at the Academy in Antwerp, um, the Academy in Antwerp is, if people don't know, it's uh, 350 years old. Um, it's an old European Academy. And it was a place that I went to, um, well, actually, after I'd done a foundation year uh, in the Glasgow School of Art, uh, which was absolutely disastrous. Um, and I, I, I actually sought out an academy um, where I could actually um, learn, as they say in French, uh, métier, which was the ability to actually, uh, you know, have the magic in the hands and actually mm. uh, make something uh, rather than what was being pushed at the, um, the Glasgow School of Art, which was very much, you know, you find something, you do something to it, uh, you do something else to it. And, um, uh, you know, it, 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 it's, it's like the... It, you keep on slightly cutting it in half and altering in it, altering it, and then you alter it again, um, and it and it goes on this kind of conceptual um, journey. But mm. it's visually, it doesn't touch you. Mm. So, 
just just on that foundation here, because my, my sister <clears throat> is doing a, an art degree, and so I kind of vicariously lived through um, <laughs> like her experience at the same time. So it's very interesting. Yeah. And the, yeah. the, I guess the kind of idea of the foundation here for those who, who don't know, who have, haven't gone through art, art school, is to get this uh, uh, grounding in a, a variety of artistic te- techniques and like some of yeah. the basics that's what it's yeah. in, th- in theory meant to do <laughs> yes. uh, but what it seemed to me to be like is like a platform for various ideas or you know whatever whatever kind of whims the tutors at the time uh w- were interested in was did you find that like did do you feel like you were like a well-rounded artist by the end of it that had, had samples all the different <laughs> types of uh, mediums or uh... well i i had cert- I, I mean i i would say i certainly felt utterly lost um i felt mm. bankrupt actually oh. um f- f- frankly n- there was like you know tr- true learning true learning happens when you can provide a context of why and what you're learning and you can give a kind of route to what you're learning but of course at the glasgow school of art it was it was all about you make it up as you go along mm. and there was no foundation and there was no root so there was no rootedness let's say mm. And it was it was post Duchampian, and mm. you can you can simply just say that um, everyone was just kind of cookie cutter shaped. Um, you know, they were just they were just creating cookies to go on to carry on. You know, you'd go on and do the, you know the sculpture, whatever at the academy um, in the Glasgow School of Art. Um, but it was it wasn't actually um, the making of real sculpture because they weren't interested in trying to actually teach you you know when i think of sculpture Mm. um and someone says oh you know i'd like to make a piece of sculpture or when i'm working you know like i have been asked at the academy to to uh, talk to some students and they want to make something and you you do have to run through some of the the ground basis elements of actually teaching them how to work with stone or how to teaching them how to model or teaching Mm. them how to um command um, uh, you know, a sense of an, uh, an ability in the hands. Um, but that, that was all gone. That was all out there. And it was purely just in the mind. And it was, a yeah. I use the word masturbation of the mind. Mm. It was, it was mind masturbation. Mm. Um, but there was no, um, th- there was never any, um, uh, you know, sort of, uh, climax. <laughs> <laughs> it, yeah. Uh, in- interesting. What, what's fascinating for me is again, even just comparing like um, the birth of what, what I, I think as the, the kind of modern um, uh, university artistic sc- school, which is of course the Bauhaus, because they were those guys were, were very hands on. So, for example, oh, they yeah. had uh, metallurgy courses or um, you know uh, like literally welding uh, textile courses. So they brought yeah. people t- to. Uh, you know, the technical and hands-on ability in difficult areas uh, abates obviously from a very particular uh, kind of uh, mo- certain kind of modernist lens at the same time, which again sure. may, may not appeal to, to to various people, but some people won't like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I think the point about you know Duchamp sort of disrupting things further. So even even that kind of like. Um, like post-academic modernist approach was then kind of su- subverted even further um w- w- where like you said you know any any i know you've kind of railed on things like found objects before etc and um sure you know like like when when you when we say sculpture again that the every the, the the guy on the street thinks of um you know like a bronze sculpture in his town or memorial but if you go sure. speak to, speak to like a an art tutor from from Glasgow, they'll be like, "Oh, these cardboard boxes are. <laughs> this is a sculptural element to it. You know, it's it's yeah. anything that you can build. You know, so, um, yeah, okay, interesting. Yeah. So you you yeah. you you, re- you rejected all of that, uh, and then like, how how did you find Antwerp? Because like, did you have connections there beforehand, or was yeah. it kind of? Yeah, so okay. I, I, we actually had family connections there um, who were connected uh, somewhat with the. Uh, the Fashion Academy, which is a world-renowned academy um, that is part of the Royal Academy. And, um, you know, these were friend, friends of the family who were, they, you know, they could see what I was doing and what I wanted. And they were like, look, 
maybe go and check this place out. See what happens. You know, it was, mm. it was kind of like, just just go there, go to a um, an open day and have a look what they're doing. And I did. And I went along and there was an immediate connection. I thought, great. I'm learning. If I, if I go to this academy, I'm learning how to um, model. I'm learning mm. how to work with clay. I'm learning how to work with stone. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm learning how to weld. Um, you know, all of the the actual building blocks of, of being able to create something um, was there. Uh, just as a side note, within 10 years, because it was like, you know, it's, it's been, a uh, you know, in, to where I am now and, and going through the academy, it's like 10 years. But within that period, um, it's completely degenerated even further. And the really? virus has okay. caught on. The virus mm. has caught on at this academy now. And there's practically no difference to what you can learn at the most conceptual schools mm. um, and the Antwerp Academy now. It is, mm. it, it has gone so far down um, that it's, you know, if, if you if you don't laugh, you'll you'll absolutely cry. Mm. So, yeah. there, there, there's, there's a really interesting um, book in uh, from the 1910s by a guy called uh, C.S. C. S. Ashby, who's an arts and crafts, um, I guess, kind of like decorative designer, basically he does like small, small little bits. And um, his book's entitled, should, we, should We Abolish Art Schools? And it's quite a fun read <laughs> for someone who's gone through that kind of experience. Because again, some of the points that he brings in is that, you know, a lot of these uh, places of learning are created just to churn out more teachers. You know, oh, it, God. it's, it, it's, it's like a tick, a, a tick box exercise or it's about creating yeah. a, a lifestyle as opposed to, like you said, what you, you are hunting for, which was, I want to become an artist. I want to become a sculptor, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I do wonder whether <clears throat> the future of learning is going to be in like almost like a workshop uh, s s system or whatever, you know, where there's these little lights of, of learning still, still lit. So. Yeah. I mean, it, it's something that I've been, um, it's something that I've been thinking about for a while, actually, you know, cause I've had, I've had a few artists and, and, and budding sculptors who have reached out to me. And they will, you know, they, they say stuff like, oh, I'm going through art school or I'm just about to go to art school. Where do you think I should go? And, you know, they, 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 they say all this kind of stuff to me. And I think, fuck, um, you're in a pretty difficult time. Mm. Um, there are academies and you can go. For, for example, there, there was a period that I was looking into going to um, one of the Russian academies. And it's it's extraordinary from a skill level, absolutely extraordinary. Yes. But there is also, I also wouldn't absolutely recommend that either, unless mm. it, it depends where you want to go. If you want to go purely down the craft, I want to be able to create absolutely picture perfect, like hyper realist um, paintings, drawings, and uh you know, sculpture and, and whatever in the, fr fr from the more classical school, then yeah, sure. Go, go and check it out. Um, but, and, and there's, there's also these academies in Italy too. Mm. But what I would say is if you are someone who, I would only recommend it if you, if, if, if it, if you are someone who has a true vision and by a true vision, I mean something stirring inside of you that says, once I've learned this ability, once I have actually learned this metier and this, this, this magic in the hands, I can go on and I can dream in, in this style and I can find myself within this um, divine knowledge, mm. then I can recommend it to you. But of, if you are not and you're someone who's there and you're not too sure what to do and you're going to throw yourself into one of these academies, um, you're going to be consumed by uh, the tutors that are teaching you and you're going to end up um, turning into, as what I saw, because I, I came in contact with a number of the uh, Russian school um, academy students at a certain point in my career, and they were all just, they could have all been working in a factory. They could produce mm. hyper real. Really, you couldn't fault the standard. It was mm. gorgeous. But it stopped there. And so from a fine art standpoint, I was like, I was a bit let down because I thought, wow, I'd, lo I'd love to see you guys dreaming. Mm. I'd love to see you guys truly getting into the meat of, 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 you know, showing me another world. 
Mm. But ultimately, you, you're all singing the same song and you're all getting me into the same I, into the same place. Now, the offset of that is to go to an is to go to an art school like I've already been through, you know, the Glasgow School of Art or or the Academy, which is now degenerated, which will then give you the the, the extreme opposite of that, which is like um, a hyper conceptual school and a and a sort of um, nihilistic approach to, to, to where things are going now. So it's very difficult to actually say, would you go to one of these schools or would you go to an atelier? Would you go and find a sculptor who you truly love and just say, look, pay me a pittance and I'll come and work for you or something like that. And you mm. might actually pick up um, some of the approach and how you, um, you know, how he or, or, or she um, does commissions or, um, you know, runs their atelier and, um, you, you know, that sort of thing. And, and you just learn on the job like it used to be. If you look back at, you know, Renaissance Italy, for example, early Renaissance yep. Italy and stuff like that. I mean, Donatello, um, you know, or, or, or a number of these great masters, they learnt from a very young age. These artists, yeah. these sculptors were bred. They were... Well, yeah, you know. or, or or they had interesting backgrounds. I think a, a lot. If you read um, Vasari, mm -hmm. a lot of them were related mm -hmm. to, to the gold goldsmithing guild. Yes, so that's right. Which which I think is fascinating. Again, and and actually, if you hear about the um, the Victorian new sculpture movement, a lot of them were um, like ornamental crafts craftsmen before they started out as, as, as sculpt, sculptors. Basically, so they they would be doing yeah. uh, like a th the ten thousand acanthus leafed column basically before you know starting out to, to do those work so I, I think that's a really good point about you know there's there's almost these kind of two sides the total the totally conceptual yeah. and the totally yeah. realist realistic and yeah. s some of the points about um you know you need that you need the vision and the spirit and the, the life and to, yeah to, to not be consumed by either so yeah, and and you need to. I think it's also. I mean, like w when I joined the academy, I had some old school tutors who, you know, were basically coming towards the the, the end of their career, and they were getting ready to to retire. But they they passed on a bit of a flame to me, and their approach and their and, and you know the the way they would geometrically look at um, composition and how they would look at balance and how they would look at proportions that rubbed off on me. But the younger tutors never spoke about that anymore. Um, and so I'm so grateful of what some of these older guys, you know, sort of left behind. Uh, and I was able to just grab a bit of that. <laughs> you know, I sort of mm. grabbed a bit of that um, mm. towards the end of their career. But that's no longer really taught. Um, but I'm but I'm in incredibly grateful of that. If, if you can, you know, if you can find an art school where you've still got some of these old cats that are like kicking around um, <laughs> that you can that you can sort of warm up to. Um, and, you know, there'll be kind of fatherly type figures who who will kind of be like, listen, you know, if you want to make a piece of sculpture, you've got to think about this stuff and you've got to um, understand how space works and how, uh, you know, the, the geometric kind of crystalline form of how of how a sculpture and, and why a sculpture works i mean people people in, in in some of the more progressive schools they will never explain actually why a sculpture can work you know the, mm. it, it, it's like the alignment of certain forms or just the composition of a of a of a sculpture and you think wow that really touches me i love it and then you go into it and you understand why it's touching you because there's rhythms and there's certain repetitions of forms or there's certain mm. angles that are working and this is the, this is a kind of a science, a kind of a visual science that has been, you know, it's it's intuitively felt, but it's stuff that you know we've looked into hundreds of years ago. Um, but it was stuff that was still being looked into in early modernism, essentially. Yeah. You know, it's stuff yeah. that was still kicking around. <laughs> you know. No, d definitely interesting. So, so you you left the um, academy, and then what was your kind of experience post there? Were you kind of embraced, embraced with open arms by uh, the local establishments, or? Uh... Well, it was interesting because, our, well, actually, during my academy, I was, I, I lived an extremely, um, I lived a very, very, very intense social life while I was at the academy, um, but not. I mean, like, it wasn't that I was like trying to climb ladders or anything, but I was just. I wanted to go to all the exhibitions and I wanted to be involved in 
all of the different things that was going on because I wanted to, mm. to, to really throw myself in to the art world of that, that was going on in Antwerp and in Belgium. Um, so every opportunity that I could, I was sort of going out there, talking to people, meeting people while I was still studying. And when it came to my fourth year, uh, I got I got approached by uh, three galleries, actually, um, one of which I took up on the offer. And I, you know, uh, quite quickly got a solo show. Um, and I, you know, it was a gallery that was like we it was a meeting of minds because he was like, listen, <laughs> I don't like what's going on mm. and I'm just really happy to find a sculptor who actually wants to show, you know, some actual fucking sculpture <laughs> to a degree, you know, it yeah, was like, yeah. it, there was this, there was just a meeting of minds. And I think that's what artists have to have with the gallerist. You know, it's a very personal connection and mm. you have to really vibe with your gallerist. And there was this, there was just a meeting of minds and a connection. He said, listen, I've got this space. I've got this new, this new building that I'm doing. Um, you're making large sculpture. Um, I'd like to give you an opportunity to deserve was that kind of thing. And, you know, one thing led to another and I started, I started showing with him, but he's outside the circuit. Right. So the stars aligned at that point because he's totally outside and he's not, he's not particularly liked or admired by the, uh, the art scene. In fact, the art scene and the, um, uh, so the, the art press, they, don't really like what he's doing and they want us they, they, they want to sort of you know they, they sort of want to kind of nudge him out <laughs> you know? can, and that kind can, of stuff can i just stop on there a second just to explain for the kind of non-artists <clears throat> yeah like ha how all, all of that works so you've obviously got this kind of circuit of of large galleries which will kind of put on uh like either up and coming names or yeah you know try, trying to push like there's an interesting thing here about the connection between the academies, the gallerists and um, the dealers uh, sure. ag ag where, again, this is where <clears throat> I guess kind of one of the, the criticisms of the, the modern age is the, the kind of power of, of money and oh, gotcha. you know, like that, for example, dealers will end up with a, a lot of work from a, like an older artist and they'll wait for the right time and kind of put, put, push oh, that sure. out as well. Absolutely. But then the, the, there's also this kind of market control. Yeah. 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 There's a big drive for like identifying new fresh talent and who's going to be the big new name, et cetera. So, so there very much is this kind of like, like you said, mainstream circuit of um, oh, yeah. yes. uh, like uh, galleries, et cetera. So, and also it's tied to the, the critics as well because they get kind of their uh, back scratched by uh, various uh, galleries, and yeah. that's that's how you get the invites to certain things. You know how this how, how 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 this works. I've I've been to um, I've actually represented a few artists from the kind of more on the kind of PR and the marketing side. So I've okay. seen I've seen I've seen it from a very different different angle, but okay, it's yeah. he hilarious to go. I was down at the Saatchi, for example, and okay. like everyone was just schmoozing there and no one was looking at the art it's a very weird scenario i felt like i was the only person there taking it <laughs> taking a look at the, at the arts but it's it's like a yeah. it's like a it's like a social event isn't it really they a lot of the, the showings and openings isn't it so it's a it's a um it's an entire social it, it's a social club and it's it's like it's it's very niche and if you're not with the kind of in crowd and the hip dudes and you're all speaking the right kind of lingo um, and you're not, you know, you, you all have to be kind of, um, if you want to kind of get into those crowds, you have to be doing the right kind of work and you are groomed as a young artist to even do work for certain individuals or certain organizations and institutions that will push certain agendas. I think this is something that very few people actually really understand. It's something that I've seen, I've come face to face with. I've um, watched people, uh, young artists become groomed and pushed into uh, certain places and they, and they become, you know, it's something I've, I've tweeted about on, 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 on Twitter actually, is that they become uh, marionettes. They mm. are, uh, they're, you know, they're, they're simply just someone pulling the strings and you can, you, they're, they're manufacturing these artists. And to go on to this idea of like this circuit of galleries, well, yeah, the, the circuit of galleries, they're, they're all in bed together. They all know what artists are going to be brought. They all know six months, 10 months, two years, three years ahead of time. They all know what the, the agenda is. And many of them are working together on, on, on 
um, you know, it, it sounds very conspiratorial, but this is just how it kind of works in the in the art scene. It's not it's not even like it's, a big secret when you're it's, amongst. It's, it's a biz- yeah, it's a business. That's what I think. I yeah. think people you, you need to understand it as the objective of an art gallery is not to find to have a transcendental transcendent experience between yeah. art and man, but it's about yeah. make, making a lot of money, basically. So for yeah, a lot of them, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that, that's Indeed. true, and, and and there are there are, there are obviously gen- genuine people as well. So you got your ind- independent gallery, and that's kind of like where you kind of um, got got your kind of f- f- first kind of sh- showing. And then how's it how's it been since yeah. then, basically? And and that was where I was flourishing. Um, that's where things made. I mean, when I say flourishing, I mean geez, it's a huge word. But that that's where things made sense to me. Where I had people coming and saying, "Wow, it's so great to see." a sculptor who's sculpting and doing this stuff. And, and people were saying that because the majority of the, of what you were seeing actually at that time was, was the hyper conceptual kind of stuff that was going on, which I was becoming very much counter to. Um, and it was interesting because um, I was having these, th- these shows and there was an audience for it and it was growing and people, people were collecting it. And people wanted to show it and people wanted to be around um, that that sort of energy of what I was doing. And that's for me, that's like a fantastic small victory. I mean, it's just in Antwerp. It's just a, it's a small city, but it's great to have been able to do that with my gallerist and um, to have actually kind of forged something in an independent manner and to see that there has been quite a. There's a want for this. There's a want mm. for you know, like the, 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 there are so many gallery goers or, 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 you know, people who are involved in art or, or, or whatever. And they're like, God, it's a breath of fresh air just to see someone make something. And that mm. sounds crazy. It sounds crazy to even say that because it's like, well, of course you should just be making something. You're a fucking mm. sculptor. Mm. But if you're in, like, if you're kind of more in depth in, in, in the art world and you see what's going on, it's it, it's actually seldom. It's it, It's rare. It's rare that, that you're actually a painter painting or a sculptor sculpting or, you know, getting involved in, in, in putting compositions together and, and, and spending your time every day bringing everything you can to your, um, you know, to, to your craft, but also to, to what you do spiritually as, a, as an artist. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that we were able to make those small victories here in Antwerp, myself and my gallerist. Um, but of course quite quickly you and as, as i've mentioned on other podcasts you start to see like um they don't like they will deny you uh, press they will mm. deny you opportunities that are unfolding they they will cancel you from group shows they will cut off certain um uh, opportunities here and there which are, you know i could tell many 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 stories of this or or they give you opportunities, but they it's 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 like a hyper political opportunity where they want to use your work simply just to um, uh, propagate a certain uh, political yeah. agenda. And I don't, you know, I don't really want my art used for that. So, uh, of, co- of course, I I sort of go directly against it. Um, mm. But it's it, it's very muddy waters, Pharaoh with what's going on in the culture world, in the arts world today. I mean, you sound like someone who who knows it quite intimately, which is great. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and actually, just on that point, um, Alexander Adams, uh, a friend of yours, um, he's written extensively about this sort of stuff in, 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 in his books. And yeah. he hits the nail on the head. He's absolutely on it. He's absolutely on it, it, it you know. Well, he, he he often has difficulty getting into certain shows. He's again sort of on the blacklist, but he's also got some of the. Yeah. It's it's quite fun because he sometimes s- sneaks through the censors and then and then is allowed <laughs> into uh, the kind of he he is the heretic in the in the hallowed halls basically. So uh, amazing. I, I, amazing! I I imagine it's a it's a similar experience. To you. Oh, I know the vibe. I know yeah. the feeling. Yeah, I, I I really hope you like have a folder of all of your worst reviews from the uh the the kind of evil art critic ideologues um, well it's actually you know it, it's funny you talk about folder of worst reviews it's actually just a blackout what you have is you have they i mean i've i've, I've had some i've had some relatively okay press this was a few years ago but at a certain point there was just a blackout it just yeah. it, it, it just became a blackout they were like there was there was press becoming interested and then there was a blackout. And then I even had 
I can't mention names, but I even had, there was this one journalist who said to me, listen, we can't, we're not going to publicize you. There's nothing that we can put in there. And if I mention any more about this, I'm going to lose my job. But it's just, she was like, I'm just drawing the line at that. And that's mm. it. And I was like, God, I'm just trying to make some sculpture here. And I'm just trying to push out some, you know, a, a kind of positive, vital message about making honest sculpture in stone and in bronze. And with a bit of verve and a bit of, you know, panache to it, um, to try and gather some 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 energy around around what I'm doing, and not they're not happy about it, not wanting it, not well, so it's, it's not, the, the, not allowed. The the, the the light illuminating in the darkness. There, no one likes. To, <laughs> no one wants to to kind of see what they're they're you know. I, I, I think I do wonder whether it's partly, like I said, it's kind of people being exposed, but all, but also there is an envy thing as well, where again that everyone everyone at some point had had a a path to choose and they chose poorly, or they you know, and and uh, you know they're kind of looking at a genuine a genuine artist and, and regretting that. But um, okay, well I want I, I, I want to I wanna draw a line under the uh, under the under the chat for now because i want to get into the work and i think that's Absolutely. a perfect a perfect thing Go ahead. And, and, and and can i just say fen i think one thing that you've done excellently is kind of like your um i guess your self publication and your on, online work whoever you whoever's your publicist give them a pay pay rise Ex, excellent work <laughs> fen, fen has like some of the best like video little bits of video content and uh, footage and camera work out of like any artist i've seen like even like some of the top top ones so, so well, I, I, yeah, I, I get the impression but, you just kind of you, you're just kind of pu pushing it out yourself, and like you said, you're kind of like I'm not getting press from the, the newspaper, no. so I'm just going to do it myself, basically. So hats L off. L yeah, no, I'm I'm doing it myself. I'm actually doing it with my wife, and she she does a lot of my my camera work and film. Um, and I mean, it's not just her, but it's you know, it, it's she's contributed to a number of different uh, videos, and it's it's a great teamwork because we actually just came to the point where we were like, fuck. What are we going to do? Like mm. they're closing every damn door. Mm. And if there's one, I mean, that's how I came online. That's how I actually, I mean, I'm kind of new, like, as I've said many times on other podcasts, I'm new to this space in, in terms of Twitter. I haven't, I, I'm not like one of these guys who spent their life on the internet. Um, I yeah, am quite new to this sounds like thing. You're out partying all the time, Fen, you know, everyone else on the internet, you are just, I get, <laughs> it was heavy. So, 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 socializing, you know, <laughs> It was, it was, it was cultural, but it was, it was with plenty of uh, alcohol at the same time, but it was, it, <laughs> it was good. It was needed. It was needed. I had to get it out of my system because now I'm damn serious on what I'm doing. So. F F Fen, I'm so sorry to ex expose this. So apolo apologies if I, I said it, but uh, there was a moment where uh, in a discord chat, uh, Stoughton and I had to explain what a furry was to, to Fen, you, you know, you know, just never never heard of it yeah. before. That's that's the yeah. level of lack of exposure. Um, this and but... and and unfortunately, after the after the event, after the exposure, I was um, I sort of went down a black hole for a few days. <laughs> I, I was like, what what have I just witnessed? <laughs> <laughs> I'm still waiting for your futurist furry. Uh, it will in, never in, come. In, in, interpretation. <laughs> the big money. There's big money. <laughs> I, I mean, it. you'll yeah. never see me touch on it. Okay, it's for, it's for, it's for the best. It's not a transcendent <laughs> subject. I I, ho I wholly approve. Okay, let's let's get to the let's get to the work before I, uh, yeah. What in fact, one thing I wanted to to, to share was um, Fen's uh, manifesto, which is which is which is cool. So again, like, this is part of your last show, wasn't it? Yeah, this was my most recent show. Um, I wanted to. You know, I've said this some time. I wanted to state my ground, and I wanted to throw myself out there in a pit of vipers, and literally just say, "Look, this is who I am. This is what I stand for, and I'm coming out guns blazing." And I want you guys to just just soak this up. I'm 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 throwing it in your face. I made this this thing huge. I made this massive massive uh, thing, um, and I just threw it in my exhibition. I saw a lot of sour faces, which I adored. Um, I saw I saw a lot of people that were getting triggered by it, which is great. 
that's exactly what I what I sort of hoped. Um, but ultimately, I just wanted to state my ground, and and it was also like, it was like a rallying call. But it was, it was, it was funny because after putting it out there, there was like there were certain people who were saying, "Wow, I really like that you're doing this," and it's it's really nice that you've got the confidence to say these certain things. I mean, it's not even that it's not even that inflammatory, you know. But in the art world of today, it actually is. So um, I, I threw that out there, and you had people being like, "I get what you're saying," but if I actually come out and say these sort of things myself, I'll lose an exhibition or there's like certain things mm. that will be taken away from me. And you just think to yourself, guys, you live in this time. You're here now. Mm. What are you going to do about it? Have some bravery and let's fucking go for it. You know, that was that was the general feeling that I had. Anyway, it's the, the, I've thrown it out on the internet now and I'm, I'm, I'm really happy that it's resonated with a number of people online, you know, and they've, and they've kind of got it. You yeah. Know? And, and again, just kind of, contextualize it you know the, the, i think for, for me the manifesto is this kind of uniquely like 19th, 19th century um in, invention where you know you're trying to formalize some of those ideas and trying to like pull different threads together in a simple way but i quite like how mm -hmm. you, you've got these kind of uh almost machine gun of uh <laughs> I, I, ideas you know these very short sharp you know <clears throat> I, I have uh, saved the Futurist Manifesto, which I thought would, would go into for one of one of the works. So you can compare it. Uh, listeners can compare and contrast. They often are very verbose and quite wordy. Oh, yeah. I, 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 I like it's just kind of simple, short, but also kind of kind of de deadly. I mean, you know, kill art speak. No wonder you're persona non grata after, uh, after having this. I'm surprised <laughs> you ever get showed again. But anyway... I, <laughs> Well, I mean, <laughs> the thing is, is with any manifesto, you've got to come out there punching. You've got to, you've got to yeah. go, like, you, you can't have like a, like a, oh, I'm going to be a little bit sweet and soft manifesto. You know, they, they, they did kind of, you know, they kind of put it out there. And, and I think that's important, but at the same time, it's not that, it's not that damn hard. I mean, I'm not, I'm yeah. not saying anything that heavy really, but you know, it is what it is. We live in such a fucking, uh, yeah. You get it. You, you, everyone knows what, what we're living through now. So yeah, I, I I really love just some of it. Like yeah, the most revolutionary actors that actually make something. Yes. <laughs> and, 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 yes. And again, it's just like just do just do the work. It's like a it's a classic adage that has been long forgotten. But um, okay, I want I want to get into um, some of the work. So the way that we do these interviews is by presenting. <clears throat> A couple of picks from the artist, and then I've tried to pair it to some of their work. Um, so, and, and I've, I've mixed up the order and d done a few tweaks, if that's okay. I've taken a few liberties, but hopefully it should oh, all go be ahead. Okay, go okay ahead, still. Yeah. So, so the first one is um, from Palo Uccello, and it's St. George and the Dragon. So, um, can I just tell you a little bit of a story about this work before, Please before, do. We, start, before we start? Uh, Please back do. At, Back at school, I was a very, uh, and I still am, a very science orientated person. I, I was okay. big into big into science. I, I didn't, I didn't do GC, GCSE art at all. Um, and one of my first interactions with uh, a kind of classical art was like this artistic appreciation, um, like course that we had to do, where the uh, like the vice principal uh, came came like tried to present works and getting us thinking about art, which I thought was a really like in retrospect was a really useful thing but this was the work that he chose and and described and at the time i i, I was just so confused and i was like oh this is terrible this is this is very un unrealistic piece of art but and actually when, when you think about kind of um uh renaissance works and uh, like post, post post medieval they aren't these kind of they're not as trad as you'd think is what i'm trying i'm trying to say sure. but also this this is a this work has a special place in my own personal kind of conversion to, to art as a, as a powerful uh right as a yeah. pow pa powerful force but i want, I want to, fen this is this, this is about you i want to hear about how like what, yeah why are you interested in this piece well i came across this work years ago it's in the national gallery and um i that this burnt an image on my mind it, i mean it sort of burnt into my you know, into into a deep area of my conscious, subconscious, let's say, um, because it's it's. I think as an artist or being an artist, I'm always thinking in archetypes. I'm always thinking in 
principles. And St. George and the Dragon, it's it goes back many, many years. And it's it's one of those ancient things. It's like man slays beast, hero slays beast. Hero, what is the beast? What does the beast stand for? What is the principle that the, that the hero and the beast stand for? And this is something that's a fascinating uh, thing as you delve into it and you go into it. And, um, you know, does does you know it's like there's been a number of different interpretations of the dragon is the dragon um you know does it represent evil does it represent the ego does it represent an aspect of man's mind does it represent an aspect of society does it represent a um archetype of society that must be slain in order to you know certain things and of course there's the you know the, the religious and, and connected to christianity and stuff like that but um this sort of burnt into my mind and i and it spoke to me deeply and I, I'd been wanting to for quite a long time to actually make a piece of sculpture that represented that. And it's like, I saw it years ago and then it's, it's that thing where the image kind of passes through your mind and you keep on getting, you know, it keeps on getting flashbacks or at least it happens in my mind. I keep on having these images of how could that, be seen as a piece of sculpture or how could that be interpreted or how how could that be seen as a man on a horse or it's a knight slaying a slaying a beast um and it triggered a response in how i wanted to interpret a piece of sculpture uh in a very 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 direct way um but i've also had like a, a series of other sculptures that are seeing all kinds of different compositions based on this and i'm and the piece that I've made now, it's like I, I already want to do four or five other different manifestations of this. St. Saint, Saint George and the Dragon, I mean, it's 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 a timeless story. Uh, it's a timeless archetype. Yeah, you know? I, I guess that's a really important point as well as like part of traditional thinking is about <laughs> iterations and variations and thinking about different aspects. And that's what makes... Uh, that's what makes covering the same subject actually still interesting. And again, this is a very different uh, interpretation to, to one that people may have seen. For, for example, a couple of things. So it's funny you chose Uccello because I don't know if you know that, um, you know, that uh, Bap, Bronze Age pervert, he did quite a, a, a large uh, deep dive onto Uccello recently on one of his podcasts. Um, oh, I had no idea. No, not see, a it's, clue. It's, 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 I, I'm it's, actually not following Bap. I, I, yes. I haven't read his book. I'm not aware of what he's doing. People keep on saying to me, read his book, do this, and that, you know, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm glossing other books at the moment, but I maybe at certain point will uh, read what he's done, but I'm just, I'm just not there yet. I'm just, I'm just too busy with other stuff. Yeah. You know, he's a, he's a funny guy, but it was also hilarious hearing this. He has got like this very thick uh, kind of Eastern European accent or whatever talking about uh, Uccello. And I, I get um, Uccello also features in Vasari's, uh, in the lives of painters I mentioned. And Vasari talks about Uccello as this, basically, uh, I describe him as, as a bit of a neat. He sort of sits at home all day, just doing nothing. He's a bit of a, sh bit of a shut in, but he's also obsessed what, but, with, sorry. So, so, sorry, Fair. what's a neat? Oh, a, a neat is um, not an education or uh, employment. So okay. it's someone, it's like right. a shut, it's like, it's like a shut in basically. It's like, all a, right. okay, there you go. We'll, we'll get, we'll get you up to speed on the lingo one, one day, Fern. <laughs> Okay, man. Just keep going. Yeah, sure. But yeah. Um, he, he was obsessed with perspective and spent so, like so much time trying to work out like what, what the most beautiful perspective was. And yeah. Vasari, Vasari said that Uccello was second to none with his perspective. Um, but because of his obsession, he never really created any works. And he was best mates with Michelangelo. I mean, just just imagine that for a second. I mean, that's pretty, pretty awesome. Uh, and, and Michelangelo was forever just like knocking on his door, telling each other get to, to get back to work, basically. So, so <laughs> the, 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 there's there's not that many bits of work uh, for, for you to see. There's like a, the Midnight Hunt is is pretty amazing. Like each other does his horse, horses amazingly well. So, sorry, the, yeah. yeah, the the honestly the knights on horses that Uccello does, and he's done a number of these. I think are probably some of the most extraordinary um bits of work that i would encourage anyone to go and look at check out Uccello's work look at the knights on horses um 
it's funny because when I look at it, I'm having this weird thing. I'm kind of having this back to the future vibe where I look at it and I say, that's hyper modernist. There's something there where, where, where it's like, it's timeless and it's, but it also yeah. feels in a way there's aspects of modernism kind of shining through. And I just, I mean, the, the, the guys, the, the guy was divinely inspired and, uh, you know, I, everything is so crisp and it just has this beautiful, it has this really beautiful quality to it. And I don't use beauty or the word beautiful uh, lightly. It really is just, it's just gorgeous. And the way the, um, you know, if you, the, the, there's like some scenes where you, where you, well, there's some paintings where there's like knights on horses and, and you have to look at the lines and look at the composition and look at what he's playing with. Don't look at the actual details. Step back. Have a look at the way in which the geometric crystalline uh, foundations are planned out on his work. It's genius. It's genius stuff. Yeah, and it's funny you mentioned that because again, there is this kind of strength and power to to, to the horse. Uh, the, the other key, the other interesting thing, um, you've you've got this kind of interesting symbology with the circles. So you'll notice the kind of the circles on the wings of the dragon. That's why I'm saying it's a unique version of um, um, of Saint George. Normally the dragon is unadorned, but you've got these mm. myster mysterious spots. You've got this. Uh, mysterious cloud formation in the sky this uh, the circles of his armor the circles on the horse the circles on the ground you've got so that yeah you've got that absolutely wonderful di diagonal uh, breaking of the entire composition of the spear firing mm. into the dragon's sort of mouth nose head area it, it's yeah sorry carry on no no uh, um so, so it, it has this kind of interesting deep um hidden symbology to it and no one really knows about the circles again this is this is a absolute millennial point but my favorite little moment is the uh the kind of princess with her, her hand uh, like outlaid almost kind of like bro why did you just kill my dragon <laughs> that, is, that is brilliant yeah. that's right she's got him she got the dragon on a leash yeah, well, exactly, but that, I think that's what each other's toying with a little bit. Is 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 the dragon the captive, or is she? You know, there's something <laughs> interesting there. Literally, it's, literally, yeah. the white knight's coming in, destroying the dragon. Uh, you know, <laughs> anyway. it's sort of like the, the 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 knight comes in, he kind of overplays his hand a bit, and she's like, Jesus, okay, <laughs> wow, <laughs> yeah, it's brilliant. Right, okay, let's go to defense work and. Uh, I thought I thought the most appropriate one was, of course, the the, the one with the the dragon in it. But um, this yeah. is this is this is called Blast. I've got a couple of pictures, but maybe do you want to do a bit of an introduction to it? So. Yeah. So um, I wanted to create a piece. It's almost like a chess piece. It's almost a chess piece of uh, sculpture. It's the knight and the dragon entwined in this. Um, they're very kind of they're facing off. They're directly in each other's faces. And the dragon is part of of the knight, and he's the, the thing that I again this the representation of the dragon for me is like it's a part of man, it's part of man's mind, the psyche. If you can, if you can um, conquer that element of yourself, and if that can go beyond yourself, then that's kind of like a righteous act. It's the right thing to do. It's a noble thing to do. And I wanted to bring that into almost like a chess piece. You have this dragon, it's blowing fire over the knight's shoulder. The, the, the knight is lancing the dragon. If you look on the other picture, the wing, essentially he's grabbing the dragon's wing. But if you see that very small little um, uh, sort of cylindrical form coming out of his arm at the back, it's actually a reference. Yes, it's a reference to the um, to the lance, but the lance is actually um, part of the dragon's wing. So they're kind of melding together. the The dragon's wing is going through the night, and there's just 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 this kind of um, movement of this thing twisting together. And I wanted to try and capture it in a very direct, primitive is 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 is, is a word that you could use. Um, it's a kind of absolute. It's it it shows. It's not it's not hyper refined in 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 terms of you know going for any any, any sort of realism, but it's a kind of a chess piece in some respects. Mm. And I got really interested in that. I wanted to capture it in a very direct way. 
Um, of course, you can see my, you know, the influence of early modernism. Uh, it's called Blast, which is also a uh, sort of a nod Vortices, and a wink. To, words, yeah. Yeah. To the manifesto of the Vorticists, um, which I have found, you know, somewhat interesting, at, you know, certain times. So, yeah, I mean, this was just, this was a piece that I had been wanting to work on for a while, but this is now, you know, having made this piece, I've now got like multiple other ideas coming out of this. And I'm thinking, where can I take this further? How can I go, you know, further with this composition and, and, and stuff like that? So, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll make a work, but it's haunting you because mm. it's asking you back because it's a, it's an archetypal thing that's it, that's important and it needs to be addressed. And so you keep on, you kind of keep on, well, I do, I keep obsessing about it. Um, so I think it's something that I'll probably uh, work through in other compositions to come in stone or in bronze. Yeah. Just going back to that, that point I made earlier around one of the appeals of St. George is again, these kind of iterations. And, and I'm trying to think of anything, any other examples where um, again, the dragon is is kind of like a reflection of the person himself you know often the dragon is shown as this kind of um the figure of pure evil but it, but again yeah. the kind of the connection between the two and I, and I really love the kind of faces opposite opposite each other mm -hmm. so, so you've got you're, you're capturing that kind of moment of you know almost kind of panic and angst from the dragon but also it's, it's do you know what i'm saying he's, he's kind of just been stabbed but it's also kind of <laughs> Uh, it's also you know it's, it's, there's, there's, there's something there's something more to it as well you've got this kind of str yeah. str strong strong motion from it which again yeah, is, I mean, very it's, it's very difficult from like a like you said it is a chess piece in it's in it's kind of uh, yeah. um like ra ratios and factors so yeah. when you haven't when you haven't got much width to a sculpture it's hard it's really hard to show forward motion because you can't have these kind of big limbs flying around but you've still got a no. lot of uh energy flying around i would say for, from the uh from the work so yeah i mean it's it's you know you have to stick to the confines of the block really um you know with sculpture that's that's one of the main things you know, you, you have a block you go to the quarry <laughs> you go to a, a stone cutter and you say look i want this block and you're dreaming into that block you're confined by the nature of a block of stone and you have to be able to find a spatial composition within that block um you know that is stone carving Mm. And that this this is French limestone, is that is that right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Like, do do you ever have any kind of it's like cathedral um... stone? Actually, it's a cathedral stone. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, do, and and do you ever have, have like a Michelangelo moment where you know you you kind of ha you sort of abandon works halfway through? Do you have a, a studio littered with like um, dreams yeah. that never could fully come out of the the stone? Or well, um... I I have I have a studio littered with um small maquettes in clay that mm. i have worked on and then you know it, it, it's funny because you get into this relationship with with the clay and the material and you're working in it and 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 it can be it's funny because you sort of fall in love with what's going on and you've got this clay thing and it's and you're following it and every day you're there putting energy into it and you're and you're watching it develop um and and sometimes that that relationship blossoms and it turns into a piece of sculpture. But mm. other times it kind of almost becomes an abusive relationship <laughs> where you're where you're sort of you're, you're you're trying to breathe life into this piece of material and it just doesn't want it. And you followed it to a certain point and then you say, you know what? This doesn't work. And you put it to the side. And I don't like to destroy the maquettes or the sketches that I've done in clay because interestingly enough years later they can inform me and they can they can tell me to go back to a certain idea mm -hmm. or revisit a certain concept or idea again so you know that's that's kind of like a i always look at a maquette like a wish you have a wish and that's you lovely. put that into yeah. into the material and you say look i wish this to come but it doesn't always happen well, yeah, and that's I, just how it is. I, I was going to say there's a really uh, interesting sculpture book by uh, a sculptor mm -hmm. called Toft, who, uh, again, is a part of this kind of new, new sculpture group. And he describes sculptors as um, unlike any other kind of artist, because they they have um, 
yeah, that, that, that kind of workshops are littered with unfulfilled dreams and dashed hopes from various commissions. And he's, and he's he basically like warns off everyone at the start from doing sculpture <laughs> because so such like so little of the ideas often get get realized i, th I, th I think that's it. You, know, you, you you've got the, the chance of doing um you know more more stuff because it's i guess like like how much of your stuff is commission based would you do, you do you create the works for commission or do you uh mm. you know just just try and put stuff out there well the, the majority of the stuff that i'm doing is is really just um kind of coming off my own drive but I am getting commissions and the one like the thing that I love when I get a commission is when is when the you know they come to me and they say look Fen make what you love but do it about this subject or do it about this sort of thing but make what you love in terms of we don't want to we don't want to be too in the way and that's the mm. most wonderful thing because then you can truly dream and it's that it's that act of dreaming and that process of dreaming where you can just let the imagination you follow, you follow that spark in the dark and you follow it. And, and eventually it kind of, it brings you to something and it, and it, and it, and then it lights up the room and you go, shit, okay, this is where it's going. This is what it is. That's the creative mm. process for me. It's never this, you know, I, I, I think Henry Moore, he said, um, he said, be the master of a material, but not in a cruel way. And I absolutely love that quote. I think it was Henry Moore. I could be wrong. Be the master of a material, but not in a cruel way. And what he means to say with that is that never force yourself too hard on the material and what you're trying to do, because you often see that you'll, you, you'll, you'll see a piece of work and you think, God, that guy just, that guy forced it so hard. Mm -hmm. You know, he really wanted it to be something and it just ended up being a contrived piece of tosh, you know? And it didn't, it didn't have the fire in it and it didn't have that magic in it. And I think as a sculptor, that's what I, I try to, I, I try to pursue that, you know, and you pursue that in a piece of clay as a maquette. Sometimes it gets there. Sometimes it doesn't. That's mm. just the way it is. That's, that's the process. And making sculpture is a process driven thing for me. Um, I'm, I'm never trying to force myself too hard on it. I, I, I do. I do come from the idea that there's something behind our mind that leads us or there's something beyond us that leads us. And I think that's an organic process and it's a natural process that we follow and you can apply it to art and you can apply it to life. And that's mm. kind of my philosophy. Okay. Very, very cool. Okay. Number two, um, it's a series of works by George Bellows. Now, I've, I'd seen these before you'd sent them, but um, I don't know a huge amount about, about the man. I don't know if you could f fill us in at all, Fen, or, or like tell us about how, how, how you knew about them. Um, yeah, early early 1900s, um, perhaps even a little bit, little bit beyond that. Um, he was doing, he was like, you know, he was schooled in sort of academic painting, but he did a series of sculptures uh, of sculpture of painting that uh focused on boxes and what was going on in the boxing arena and he's done other you know out, th th this isn't like a huge uh you know body of his work but it's a body of work that spoke to me because he's done a whole bunch of other stuff which is great too but i focused on this because i really 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 enjoy the primal and i you know i use the word primal it's it, it's the only way I can really describe Bellows boxes is that they are in this. Um, you're seeing a very animalistic aspect of man. When two men are fighting, you're seeing something that you don't see every day. Well, I mean, some, some might, but you don't see it every day. He's capturing it in this very animalistic primal way. You've got these two energies coming together. These, these men are almost interlinked and sort of absorbing into one another. This piece that you've got on the screen now just absolutely captures me. I, I, I continue to love it. I saw it years ago, continue to love it now. It's got such energy and violence and passion. And you've got these two figures and you can feel the struggle. They're bloodied. They've got this, they've got this, um, you know, they've got this damaged skin. They're going through uh, this difficult moment um as they're both fighting to win and it just it just speaks to me because I, you've got this very fleshy quality 
uh, the, the way he's painted them, they're obviously not realist. I mean, you know, the, the anatomy is kind of, it's, it's there, but it's, it's, it, it's exaggerated. And yes, it, it's almost mannerist. I, I, was, I, I was thinking, yeah. you know, this kind of like elongated freakish, freakish limbs, but it's, uh, yeah. yeah, sorry. Yeah. And you've got this kind of, they're coming together and it's like, bam, you know, there they are. They're in this, they're in this thing. You can, you, you can almost smell that room. You can smell that. Room. <laughs> You're there. Well, at least I can. I'm there. I'm feeling it. I can hear it. I can see the people's faces. Uh, the kind of I can I can hear the the sound that might have been going on. The excitement. Mm. Um, and boxing, you know, boxing back then it was it was was attended by all sorts. And um, well, you know, I, yeah, you know, yeah. You the I, upper I, classes, I like this one. Yes, the, yeah, the upper class. You had the lower classes, um, and it was. It was just, it for me. It shows man's love for that that primal. It, uh, you know, people are are sort of fascinated by this animalistic aspect of man, and they want to see it. They want to see the fighting. They want to see the battle. They want to see the blood and the sweat, and that's something that is eternal. If you look back at the Greeks, you look back at the Romans. This is something that has been adored through time, and. This captures for me as, as as a painter, he captures that. He's got it. Just 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 on that kind of animalistic nature, you know, I think you're right. There's the, the kind of the fighters themselves are, you know, the, the this kind of pr primeval forms of man, but also that the watchers themselves, you know, if, if you've ever been if you've ever been involved in a schoolyard fight. All the kids, all yes. the kids get gather around at the same time to watch. Oh yeah, and so it's so it's this eternal thing as well. It's like that. Yes, the fighting, like you, like you said, is uh, is is something <clears throat> that people want to do, but also the watching. And I just love these kind of twisted, perverse faces. You know, just the the <laughs> the, the, the grin on this chap across here, just taking glee as two men just uh, you know pummel each other to uh, annihilation. Yeah. So. Absolutely. J just, just technically, there's interesting things as well. So you've you've got this kind of um, brightness from from the uh, from the boxes. You know, they're almost il illuminated, but then everything else just sinks out into horrific darkness. This is almost like a Caravaggio, yeah. Caravaggio, the chiaroscuro of the painting. And the other thing is is the faces themselves. You like nothing is rendered. Um, like the most, I, I guess the, the the most well rendered things are the bodies themselves here, yes. even even distorted. Yes. But all of the faces, they're all these kind of caricatures and and mannequins and these half faces. Like, again, look at this gawping this guy down here. Yes. Just I know. Uh, yes. uh, there's just so many beautiful little moments here. But again, the faceless yeah. cr crowd draws us in. We're 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 one of these these people ce celebrating this kind of mo moment of pugilism. So. Uh, Exactly. I mean, these, these, in some respects, you could look at it like, you know, these, these boxes are pieces of, 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 of meat that are being smashed together. Mm. And, uh, you know, I like that. I, I actually quite like the, I, I'm one of these people, I'm one of these guys that enjoys a kind of brutal aspect of life because I mm. think nature is brutal. Mm. And I like to see that. It, it, you know, you've probably seen my spats on Twitter. I, I'm not really there for the sentimental and all the sweet <laughs> and lovey shit. I'm just not there for it. It's not my thing. It probably never will be. J um, just, just, just on that, if anyone has not subscribed to Fen's Twitter, Twitter account, please, um, I'll, I'll update the description to def uh, to include it because. He gets into some hilarious discussions. It's it's always it's always great to see. Uh, there's nothing as good as a a, a, a Twitter fight. The app, <laughs> can, can you believe Twitter's free? Can you believe it's free? Okay, well, yeah, it's a hell of a ride. Yeah. Okay. Let, let's compare it to. I, okay, I found I couldn't decide which one to do here, so I just put both in because. Right. Okay. So, like, obviously, struggle is, you know. P yeah. people people like people fighting so it was it was kind of kind of similar but um do you want, yeah do you want sure. to just talk, talk talk through this work well yeah i mean this is you know I, I can see why you chose it this is this is two men engaged in combat get engaged in gladiatorial combat or engaged in a sort of wrestling they're fighting they're them they're, they're helmeted they're masked um i wanted to capture a very 
brutal but also heroic uh, element of the dominant figure kind of pushing the other figure over. It's, you know, I modeled this in a very kind of, um, you can see, you can actually see in some of the, in some of the lines in there, there's, there's, I, I haven't tried to make it too sweet or I haven't tried to refine things too much. I mean, there's, there's refinement in there, but it's like, I just want that kind of direct graphicness of it. It's the figure he's being pushed over or he's being, you know, kind of tripped over and they're fighting. And if you were to see this in 360 degrees, you've got this kind of pyramidal, uh, composition base that they, they are, that they're sort of joined by and they're just in this, they're encapsulated in this, in this moment. And I wanted to capture that, that, that sort of, that brutality, that, that directness. Mm. It's, it's something that again, again, I think it's like, it's been looked at by the Greeks. It's been looked at by the Romans. It's, it, it's, it's from, from, from the wrestlers, from, you know, you know, all, all those different things. Um, I wanted to capture it because it also, you know, when I gave it the name struggle, it was like, okay, but how do you capture the archetype of fighting also through life? Because it's not just, it's not just this thing of two men fighting for me. In fact, none of my sculpture is about just the kind of profane element of, of two figures or a figure or something doing. It's about looking at it also on a, on an archetypal level and how can you capture a principle that is kind of universal and and then bring meaning to that so struggle is like the struggle it represents for me this this sort of this struggle this fight through life some people might not agree with me but i think life is a struggle it is a fight and i think that's a that's a good thing it should be it should be hard it should be difficult and you get into that combat with life and it's gladiatorial and I wanted to capture that in a piece of work. Yeah, <clears throat> I, I really th thought that the kind of the the way those kind of uh, the forms were kind of being portrayed and the energy that you were able to get from just a few broad brushstrokes of the the gallows work compared uh, the bellows work compared to to, to this exactly. as well, wh yes. where you know you can you can feel that the action going on here. But I, I also really like. This is this is almost kind of like a, this could be from like a Michelangelo or something. Just that the kind of pose is almost like a Renaissance, uh, <laughs> you know, someone someone like lying back. So there is a kind of a beautiful a beautifulness and a serenity to it. And sure. again, this kind of almost fourth wall breaking. Certainly with this picture, you know, where one of the people are like looking directly out to us. Uh, yes. it was, it's kind of like you're you're in there as well. This is you. This is you right now. Basically, this is your life, which I thought was uh, which yeah. I thought it was very cool and i just love the the, the the figure at the figure at the back you know it's just you mentioned kind of savagery here this is just pure yes. pure power and uh savage well yeah that, yeah i mean it's sort of pushing it's pushing the figure down it's going for the throat um yeah i mean it's 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 trying to capture for me it's trying to capture that primal element but it's also trying to it's trying to speak to something also higher and trying to a little bit go beyond that. Everything that I do, I think I, I think there was someone who described my work not that long ago, and they said it was quite graphical. I think my work is quite graphical. I, I, I try to capture something that you kind of look at and you go, okay, I get it. It's there, direct, straight ahead. Um, it's, um, it's got that immediacy to it. And I think that's what this, for me, in my, in, in, in my view, that's what this sculpture has. It's got that immediacy. Definitely. Um, also, we've got battle, which is obviously the more, more kind of like directly related to, to boxing. But I just love the movement of the pre previous one as well. Um, do you want to give us a introduction to this piece? Yeah. So this is, I mean, this is obviously a boxer. This is actually a boxer yeah. in terms of what I was inspiring it on. It's a boxer. He's kind of stepping forward. Um, he's swinging. But I wanted to, again, it's it's, it's very much connected to it's great that you've made the connection actually it's very much connected to the the struggle piece it's again that's sort of, it's, it's swinging out there isn't an opponent there but he's fighting something he's going forward into something and it's capturing that motion i just wanted to capture that movement the lines coming off it the lines coming off this piece it's like a rhythm and it's immediate again I just want to have that kind of that 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 sort of uh you see the energy running up from the from 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 his foot 
and it goes up into his arm. And it's exaggerated. It's not about capturing an actual boxer. It's about capturing the energy of a boxer. It's about capturing that primal um, swing and that that movement forward. And that's really what this this piece is about. But again, it, it resonates with that thing. It's it's battle. It's it's that battle of life. It's you you throw yourself into life. You go forward into it. You 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 engage with it. You have to. Mm. Otherwise, you otherwise you fall victim to it. You know. I, I thought what was also very interesting was again the kind of like the kind of cap on the head. Um, and this almost kind of, I, I thought it looked a little bit like kind of, uh, kind of clothing or drapery, uh, come down. Yeah. So again, like it, it is a boxer, but again, this idea of battle, uh, you know, it's not necessarily just like a boxer in a, in, in a ring as you may, may think of it, of it sure. as well. It's, it's like a, a combatant, but yes. I, also, I, I love the, the face as well. You know, it's a, it's a kind of a moment of serenity and, uh, <laughs> d- determination, you know, it's, it's yeah. not. Yeah. Um, someone who's kind of howling out there. It's just this kind of no. cold, especially I, I've made a profile view is especially excellent. I think, yeah, you know, really, really nice. It's yeah. I mean, it's trying to capture it in a, you know, we, I always come back to that same, same thing. It's like trying to capture it in a kind of archetypal manner. You know, it's, it's with, with just a few basic forms, you can see the figure is looking forward. He's staring, he's looking into something and you've got the nose, you've got the mouth, you can see the jawline. Things are in motion. Things are moving. He's wearing this cap. Is it a helmet? We don't know. But it's this this form. He's throwing himself. There's this, this twisting motion. And it's he's gazing. I always find it in, in, incredible with sculpture. If you if you just bring a little bit of a shadow into, you know, you just to build a bit of a form mm. and you put a nose and you just feel, build a bit of a form for the, you know, for the brow, the shadows create the eyes. And that changes throughout the day, but the sculpture is set alive by its shadows. And so the shadow is the light. It is it's sort of the soul within the sculpture. Mm. And that's something that I, I, I you know, I, I have been playing with for, for some time with these bronze works and stone works is I, I love shadow. I love shadow play. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I was just going to say just, just on that one thing I did notice that this is exceptionally well lit and again, it's it's there's there's a whole thing where I think to get the most out of sculpture, you obviously need to see it in person. Um, yeah, oh so, God, so, yeah. So, so Jeez, make sure yeah. you 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 follow Fen to see his next show. But all but also like the lighting is so important to again bring uh, bring the, the the shadows to life, so to speak, as well. So um, it's yeah, so for, important. Light yeah. is one of the key things um, that you know that, that that will make a that make a piece pop at the end of the day. You know. Uh, of course, you know, I, I work, a number of my works go into the garden and you'll see it in people's garden, but it's wonderful because it, it will live by the sun. But mm. if you're going to put it inside, make sure it's well lit. Make sure that your artwork is well lit, even paintings, drawings. It, it should be well lit to, to, to give it that, to give it what it needs to actually, you know, really kind of live. Yeah. Now, Fen, I don't want to digress too, too much, but I want to he- hear about the first time you went to the foundry with one of your gigantic statues and he said i want you to i want you to <laughs> to pour a gigantic bronze of <laughs> uh of one of my works what what was the reaction from the uh, from the foundry well i mean the thing is is actually when i when i did when i you know when i have brought some of these large pieces in or the first time i did it um there was a general feeling of like okay sure right we can do that um, and then of course it's like, I'm then thinking to myself, how is this going to, because, you know, when you're making, you know, when you're making bronzes, um, it, you have a number of things it's made in, you'll have it made in wax first, and then you'll have that either segment, like usually segmented into a number of different parts. And then those parts will be cast individually. And then you bring the bronzes together and you will weld, or you will have, you'll have sort of seam lines that come together. And then they have to be worked over to hide the seam lines. And for, like the thing is, is because I use so many straight lines, because I use so many sort of straight lines and and, and sort of uh, flat forms, 
um, to render a number of my sculptures, it can be an absolute nightmare <laughs> because the way the um, the way the air travels out of the bronze molds mm. when you pour it in, the way it travels out, it really doesn't like to be engaged in in some of the forms that I've done. So it actually for a number of these guys who have been casting my stuff, they they say to me they're like, oh. Yeah, we're gonna have to do. You know, they, <sighs> we have to make back. a number. Of, <laughs> we have to make a number of certain channels to, you know, make sure that that piece of section of the bronze correctly uh, casts and, and stuff like that. So it 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 becomes a little bit engineerial at times. Um, and um, if you, if you're making more organic forms, uh, the casting process is actually easier. It's actually much easier. Interesting. Okay. Um, Right, let's go on to the the third one. So this is uh, Mario Cioni, Cironi, uh and yes. the, the, the the new man. Now, I, I, you know what? Before we see this, so obviously Cironi is related to the uh, the futurist uh, group. I, I, I thought I'd read out a couple of lines from the for, for the manifesto of futurism. Any opportunity, I'll read it out because this is one of my favourite bits of text ever created in the whole of uh, history because <laughs> it is okay. totally and utterly insane but brilliant at the same time so <laughs> yes. ob ob obviously the futurists um I, I would describe as a modernist art group looking to totally redefine um or to kind of f forge ahead with a new t with a new type with a new type of art here and so yeah. we, 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 won't, we won't go through through uh all of it here but um yeah we, we want to sing the love of danger the habit of energy and rashness the essential elements of our poetry will be courage, audacity, and revolt. Uh, and uh, I'll go straight to number four because it's the most pertinent one to this here. We declare that the splendor of the world has been enriched by a new beauty, the beauty of speed. A racing automobile with its bonnet adorned with the great tube like serpents with explosive breath, a roaring motor car which seems to run on machine gun fire, is more beautiful than the victory of Samothrace. So, so, you know, one, one of the elements of um, that, that the futurists were interested in was uh, motion, energy, but also um, machinery as well. So um, do you want to do a little bit of introduction to, 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 to this work in, yeah. in that context? Yeah. Well, I saw this work when I was still a student at the academy. And I can't remember what it was. I was thumbing through one of the books in my art library um at the academy and i came across this piece and i mean what is it as a uh, it's it's not like you look at it and go wow this is just a wonderful incredible piece of work i mean it's very rude it's a very rude work and i, I use the the word rude in the sense that it's rustic it's yeah. direct it's got some it's got some it's it's i like it because it's it's daring and it's direct. And again, it works on this, this primal element. You can't really see the guy's face too well. There's a face. There's a mention of a face. And there's a nose and a mouth. But it's not trying to be sweet. It's not sentimental. The leg is just a block. It come, he's on this machine that's going at speed. And this kind of poetry, I mean, I have this thing, I have this thing when I look at work, uh, I kind of fall in love. And I, this poetry is kind of speaking to me. And I'm absorbing it. And I, and I put it away and I look back at it again and it keeps on kind of, it comes to a point where it becomes a, an obsession and it become, it starts really haunting me. And this piece was haunting me while I was still a student at the academy. And I thought to myself, one day I want to make a piece of work that is in conversation with the Italian futurists, but they're long gone. But how can I, how can I talk to them? Because we walk amongst their ghosts. We, work, we walk amongst the energy of what they left behind in this period that I call sort of, you know, period of that's lacking energy. Mm. And I, I didn't know how I was going to do it, but I knew at one point in time I was going to, I was going to um, talk to this work and um, eventually it happened. I, I spoke directly to this work that, that, you know, to use that word again, sort of triggered me, pushed me to do um, a certain thing. And I wanted to wanted to get into conversation in a, in, in a way, but they couldn't talk back to me, of course. The Italian futurists had gone. 
Um, but I could at least say, look, it was like, it, it was almost becoming this thing of like, look, you know, if you guys were still around, I could make a piece that spoke to some of the drawings or some of the paintings that you were imagining and playing around with. Mm. And that's, that's, that's a very exciting thing to do because you, you take the baton you're running, you take the baton from another artist and you you imagine or you dream of where something could have gone. But they're gone. They're long gone. They're dead. Mm. Um, just, just, just on that, you know, I think one criticism that is often uh, leveled against you is that, again, you are this kind of degenerate modernist uh, with, with no rootedness. But I, mm. I, I, I think there is this, I, I, like, or maybe not necessarily ironic traditionalness to it to, to what you're trying to do you, you're you're creating a a futurist tradition if that makes sense or a new a new modernist tradition you know in the same way that um uccello he his he's derived out of like very abstract byzantine forms you know from from kimboe who was taught by the greek masters you know yes so so, so, so it, you, you know you're almost creating a a traditional school <laughs> out of, out of the modernists, you know. So so, so you, you can always say that. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I I think it's you know when we talk about modernists, and I, I think this is a point that I'm just going to try and quickly make is you know people are like oh but look they use straight lines and it's very geometric and it's a de degeneration of all this stuff and I think to myself guys look back at your history, look back at a little bit of what was going on in you know ancient Greece and what they're doing in the archaic period. There was a lot of geometric forms going on then. It spoke to an essence. It spoke to a, it spoke to the primordial. It was archetypal. This idea of geometricization has been with us forever. You'd never have great painting without the importance or the need of the geometric spatial underlying of a composition. I'm playing with that because I can get a direct and immediate um, graphical response from a piece of sculpture or a piece of work. It's a thing that I've been playing with. I'm obviously mm -hmm. going to evolve and keep moving forward, but it's like, I look at our period now, it's like we're pulling things together. The, what, you can at least look at the futurists and say that they were they had the building blocks of form and composition. It was there. They were, mm -hmm. they were actually still informed by how uh, you know, traditional great works were made because they still understood how you would, you would divide up a, you know, a sheet of paper or how you would divide up a canvas or how you would divide up uh, space for a sculpture they still mm. had that flame they were running with it but they were going they were going into a more experimental phase which mm. is needed it's important mm. i'm now trying to grab grab back at some of these things and yes it's 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 modernist but it's true what you say i'm still informed and i'm still very much rooted in um tr tradition you know it's it, it's like i think i think the futurists were too you know, you, you, you can't, as much as they sort of pretend that they want to sort of get away with, get away from this stuff, you can't. It's there. Yeah. It's a rootedness. Yeah. that their, tra their training was with them. You know, they were trained in a, in a, in, in a certain style. And also they were living in an, an age or they, they had an inheritance at the same time. Absolutely. Um, Okay, I, I want to get I want to get through all of the work, so I'm gonna I'm gonna keep on pressing forward. I, I would love to ch chat more about that. Maybe we'll, no, we'll, go ahead. We we will get another we'll get a, a dedicated stream. We'll get a big debate stream at some at some <laughs> point on, on on that. Lots of arguments. I just want to talk about this for just for two seconds. Obviously, it's kind of black and white. So again, it's this reduction. You know, I, I think part of what the futurists are trying to do it's about emphasizing different things. If you look at re re uh, paintings that focus on realisms, uh, realism, it's about emphasizing. Um, you know, elements of the form or emotions of the person. You know, we're seeing the emotion of the person from just the form. You know, this basic hunched up figure, this uh, spectral Neanderthal almost. There's something, pr again, this primitive idea of... Absolutely. Uh, like a, like an ape strapped to a bunch of machi <laughs> machi machinery, you know. Yes. And, and, and then just, just, just look at the lines. You've got the kind of lines protruding out, showing motion. But then... The, the, then you know, there, you know what was that line again? The the, the tubes firing out. What's it going? Hold on a second. Uh, with it, a raging automobile with its bonnets adorned with great tube-like serpents with explosive breath. You know this. This is yeah, this is what we're talking go. about here. The, um, the dragons. The dragon's mouth here. And and, and I also love the kind of uh, iconization of the number four as well. Yeah. 
yeah. this person this person doesn't have a have a face but he has a number and that's what he's been reduced yeah. reduced down to and that's what you yeah that's that's all you see you know you almost um you know that, that's what he's become if you're a viewer of the uh the person as well so absolutely uh, very very cool piece of work and like I presume it's this 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 work is the one you were talking about. Otherwise, I've yeah. uh, I've, I've very poorly ch um, chosen. But uh, yeah, momentum. Your yes, absolutely. And this was, as I say, a sort of a conversation with ghosts because um, they've left behind these drawings, and I wanted to interpret that. But of course, it's not a direct carbon copy. I had to dream into this, and I had to find something. Um, that worked in three dimensions and I had to find something that worked in a three ton stone at the uh, time I wanted to make a monumental work and it came out in this manner I made one um, maquette work in clay and it was you know, sort of playing with a bunch of forms, bunch of lines. This 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 work is really driven by lines. It's driven by proportions and lines. And I just wanted to capture that motion, that speed, that energy. Here you have almost that sort of lightning bolt coming off the back. Um, but I wanted to capture this this very kind of this 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 fierce energy and this fierce power that's driving this figure forward. And people say, well, it's a motorcycle. Well, of course it's a motorcycle, but I don't look at it so much in that sense, in the profane level of just the motorcycle. It's trying to capture the archetype of speed and momentum and that energy that I, that energy that you, a society can get into when it's really driving forward or the, the creative energy that man can get into that's really pushing them forward. You, you push through when you're so driven and you're so, charged with a kind of magnetism you can walk through a wall and it's like you're on fire i have those feelings sometimes and mm. you feel so creatively driven and so excited and you you feel like nothing can stand in your way and you can just walk through walls and that's something that i think is very human and i think it's that something that people feel at times of inspiration and it's something that people feel on a mass level at times of when they're really stirred by great speakers or by um, leaders with 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 honest and true, um, you know, verve and 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 sort of fire in in, in what they're what they're doing. Um, so I wanted to capture that. It's of course it's a man on a motorcycle, but it's for me, it's that essence of speed and motion, and mm. the fire of traveling at speed and that transcendence of speed as well. And when you're traveling at speed, when you're going at very very high speed. Um, I think you do transcend nature's grasp to a certain degree. Interesting. Like for me, for, for me, I think there's some other interesting parts where again, that the kind of man almost merges in with a motorbike. So, so again, you're yes. asking the, the question, is it like you know, the, the, the idea of man fusing with, with machine? I, I always think it almost kind of looks, you, know, you talk about these kind of primitive, primitive forms that again, if, if the Greeks had survived, uh into modernity you know this would be like the the, the god of speed or something like that or like yes or, or the god of technology and this is kind of like a ho household idol to, to to that or but whatever this, this that's it pharaoh you've got it you've hit the nail on the head that's exactly it that's exactly the sort of thing that i'm going for yes mm. sorry but th this, no but this is this is one of my fa favorite works i think it's really uh really interesting and really cool um and yeah, masterfully done. And also, obviously, obviously huge. Got to ask the question: Do you do you drive a do you drive a motorcycle? <laughs> I actually don't. I don't. It, it, it's funny because um, I've, I've always been fascinated by by fighter pilots. And hmm. um, my grandfather was a was a fighter race, and um, the stories and the citations that I've read about what he did in certain combat maneuvers and stuff like that inspired me about speed because of course when you're in a when you're traveling at speed in a uh airplane i think you are i think you're going beyond your how should i put it in some respects you are a kind of god a demigod some kind of um the machine is enabling you 
to cheat the laws of nature, you know? Yes. And you become, you have this firepower that is that of a army or a, you know, you, 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 you have this, this, this potential. And I find, I find there's something extremely poetic and wonderful and interesting about that. And reading those citations and reading this stuff when I was a kid and, and looking through this stuff, it inspired me. I found it, I found it very interesting speed um, of what these fight, fighter pilots were engaged in. Okay. This is a guy on a motorcycle, but it's for me, it's still, it still represents speed. It's still talking about speed, whether you're in the air or on the ground. Um, just, j j just a side note. I, while I was in the Highlands in Scotland, there was this wonderful moment. It's something that I remember when I was a kid. Um, you have, two jets that fly together through through the the um the hills through the mountains in scotland and they fly at low altitude and they're doing training missions and they fly so fast and there's this moment where you see the plane and it's flying at such speed and you see it before you hear it because it's going at sometimes it's going faster than, than the speed of sound mm. and there's something absolutely glorious, utterly, utterly glorious about that that captivated me from a young age as I watched these 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 jets fly through. And it I, I really do think that has that has shaped me to a degree, because I think there's something so extraordinary about that. These people are in, in some respects kind of like superheroes. Mm -hmm. They're enabled by the technology, but they're also transcend. There's something also spiritual to it for me. People would be like, "What the hell are you on about?" But for me, it's it touched me from a young age. I've I've, I've experienced I've seen this stuff a lot, um, and um, find it fascinating. The, the silence thing is interesting because again, these are all, all the sculpture are sculpture works are, are silent moments. But again, it's almost like you say you're you're seeing it first before before the noise. So again, you, you, in in your head, you're thinking about yeah, what comes next, and it's it's a raging fury flying past you. Well, that's it with such glorious energy. Yeah. Okay, n number four, uh, Epstein's Rock Drill. So again, for, for Zoomers, this is not the <laughs> Epstein recently... Uh, <laughs> def definitely suicided Epstein. This was the actually... Yes, uh, that's right. That's uh, right. Very, very, inter very interesting artist uh, at the turn of the century. But um, maybe do you want to do a bit, bit of introduction to, to, to the artist and the work? Well, yeah, I mean, he was he was known as um, Sir Jacob Epstein. Uh, he was an American British sculptor. Uh, he was busy in um, early 1900s. He flirted with the Vorticist movement, although never actually signed the manifesto. Um, I think this was a really interesting time, short lived. It was before the war. Um, this piece of sculpture, uh, the Rock Drill, um, was. A kind of se seminal work in the sense that it it if you look at his other works this kind of feel, feels like it, it it sort of landed from another planet actually it came out of some kind of void i actually consider it a demonic work um mm. but i use i use it in a in a light sense it's demonic in the sense that it's like i think it's extraordinary that this piece came out and through him mm. and it's been left behind we can look at it but it was also a piece of work that lived because it, it came before First World War and then after the First World War and all the mechanization and death that resulted from the First World War, he actually cut it down. He cut the piece down. He deformed it. And all that remains, I mean, the, on the left there, you've got the plaster figure. That's a reproduction. On the right, you have the bronze original, which was a plaster and then he turned it into a bronze. But what you have on the right is actually the original plaster that's been cast into bronze that he deformed and cut after the First World War. So it was a piece of work that actually lived. It was a piece of work that, 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 that traveled, started out on the rock drill. He then fell out of love with, with um, the, the mechanical and the mechanization. And then it became that thing of like, wow, look at what we've done to ourselves. We've deformed ourselves. We've cut ourselves apart. And... Of course, the defamation of the, the 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 European spirit from essentially a European civil war, to, but also like the physical defamation of man at that time, who was mm. totally 
and utterly cut apart by um, the First World War physically on an individual level, uh, on a mass level. Um, and so this piece of work, is it's, it's a very interesting piece. It, it lived, I actually, I look at it as almost like a kind of a gargoyle. It's mm. uh, on the same level as a, as a sort of gargoyle. It, it's it's utterly demonic. Look at this darn thing. It's 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 on it's on this rock drill. It's you know as a small side note. I think it was actually the inspiration for um, the uh, Star Wars uh, robots. There was some there was some talk about that that it was actually used okay. as the uh, inspiration for that original. You know, uh, back in the day, um, and I think it's one of these works where it's like. For me personally, I look at it and I think, where the hell did that come from? And well, it's yeah. just come out of a, it feels to me like it's come out of some kind of kind of void. That's why I call it demonic. It's it's like it's sort of through Epstein, this thing arrived. It's very dystopian. Mm. But it's also at the same time, it's like you can't look away because it's intriguing. It's like, what the yeah. hell is this thing? It's a robot, it's a knight, it's it's a, atop this rock drill. Is the is the rock drill a reference to the primitive aspect of man's penis? It's it's like the sexual energy, but it's maybe not. You know, it's it, it's kind of playing around with all these different things. It's like most of these early modernists, they were looking at uh, primitive cultures. Um, I, I I do believe that the the actual drill itself is uh, a reference to some kind of cock. Yeah, it's it was, but it's also a real drill, like it was actually used. But I think he saw it's a real rock it. drill. Yeah, so, so it like it actually works, but again, yeah. I think like, like I said, it's like the euphemism, euphemism is obvious. I think I think the yes. important part about the the tribalism as well, and again, what's some like the, I think one of the problem with with the term modernism, it just means so many different things to so many different people, and so like, many. For example, like with the futurists, they don't really draw that much upon um, like tribal cultures and external factors. You know, they 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 come out of like Italian traditions and or also French traditions as well. And then that's how they get to their to their works. It's kind of abstraction from um <clears throat> like existing works. But there's also a tranche of modernists, you know, Picasso being another example, where they 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 looked heavenly heavily at the external. And uh, yeah. but what I think is interesting about Epstein is that if if you see he does a lot of um Works related to buildings, you know, like relief works, uh, sculptural yes. work. Obviously, in conjunction with, um, he does some with Moore and also Gill. You know, th yep. like he's part of that kind of similar set. If you see Moore, if you see Gill, they're very smooth. It's about these kind of like bloated, <laughs> uh, simplified forms. But just compare this this work here. It's just harsh angles. It's almost like the, the head of some kind of witch doctor's face mask that's, that's been t taken. I, I think I think you're right when it's demonic because it's probably yeah. from like inspired by some kind of like, um, um, you know, distant tribe that has these kind of demon dancers or whatever, you know, they, they, rep yeah. they, they often have like representations of spiritual forms or whatever. So it's, 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 it's interesting that kind of connection between the spiritual and the mechanical at the same time. So. Absolutely, it's a, and it, and it and it casts such a dy dystopian image, and um, that well, that's what he wanted to do. He was actually talking about the dystopia of of of, of society as it modernized, and, and you know, he was quite critical of that and stuff like that. Um, but it's just, you know, I would say it's probably that's why I call it a seminal work. I mean, it's something that you that brings a language into the sculptural realm at that time that you really look at and you say, Jesus, where did that come from? Where did that come from? You know. Yeah. Okay, let's compare it. Uh, I, it. I mean, I, I did, had to obviously do industrious, which was your rock drill. But I've been, I've done something a little bit different here, here, Fen. <laughs> I, ha I, I haven't used your actual work because one thing I love is your um, your little sketches that you do and oh, yeah. and and the maquettes. So this was kind of like a love letter to. Um, some of your little drawings, which you don't, you don't show enough of. I, th I think they are tr truly wonderful, some of the preparatory sketches. Yeah. Um, and in, in, in some ways, I sort of preferred this to the actual sculptural piece, um, just right, because yeah. the, 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 it was kind of like a sl slightly bigger and also kind of like um, the, the face lo looking out uh, at you 
was was really cool. Now, am I right in thinking you, you made you did a bit of like modification in like Photoshop after uh, after yeah. effects? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I threw in some highlights and I was just like, okay, boom. This is yeah, the yeah, I, yeah, ex exactly. But like, definitely check out Fen's Instagram because he does some really like lovely sketches of the work beforehand, which I think are just lovely, just not really nice bits of work in their in their own right. But um, uh, yeah, do you want to just talk through? I, w w was it related to that to, to rock drill, or was it something something different? Yeah. So no, no, it yeah. is. It's it is again. It's looking at that work, but I wanted to bring back some element of humanity into it and um and it was this idea i called it industrious uh it was the the archetype of actually just um you know really putting in the work and and, and kind of uh, engaging and and being in the in the process in the motion of working of physically working and celebrating that you know it's it's like um when I go to different art fairs, for example, and I see Greek and Roman work, and they make these very small little kind of bronze venerations of different gods, goddesses, different things. I wanted to kind of um, do my own reference of that, but in a in a more kind of you know modern or you know of this time way. Um, and I wanted to just venerate the the archetype of industriousness, yeah, um, you know, they, being they, they, call, they call it a votive offering. That's what that's you, right, you bring... a votive. You, you'd bring it to Delphi to uh, you know to celebrate the the gods. Yeah, that's that's Absolutely. cool. I like it. Absolutely. I, I, yeah, I I see this almost as a bit of a self portrait as well because this is literally <laughs> what you do as part of some of your uh, <laughs> uh, other works as well. So I like to think this is how you see yourself when you're uh, <laughs> you're doing your work. This kind of like mega buff guy with a cool mask. <laughs> I mean, come well, on, you, you you got to feel pretty badass when you're uh, like literally carving stone with a gigantic drill. So. Um, it, it feels glorious. There's something wonderful about working in a material that is, you know, it's thousands of years old, and um, you've got this, you've got the 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 sound that is just insane, and you've got the dust, and there's um, you're in combat with that with that stone, and I yeah, I enjoy that. It gives me a huge amount of energy, and um, it's like you know you, you you're the stone is so much harder than you and you've got these different tools and I have, you know, I have my roughing out. Um, I have like different sort of roughing out tools, which are kind of almost like a sort of heavy um, hammer drill. And then I've got, of course, when I go down to the more refined stuff, I'm just using a hammer and chisel and I'm just doing the, the more refined, uh, refined things. But it's stone carving is a very gruff and uh, uh, primal act. Yeah. It's, it's physically demand. It's physically demanding again. And that's extremely. Right. Yes, it's it's interesting. It's got that kind of natural physicality to it. And speaking of uh, the physical, we've got uh, uh, the pancreation. Yes, um, love this work. Yeah, absolutely love this work. I mean, j just first of all, immediate thing that hits you: look at that pyramidal composition. Immediately, pyramidal composition, mm. the figure, the dominant figure over the you know figure that's that's submitting. Um, it's just pyramidal composition that's just directly there. You walk around this, that same pyramidal composition is there seen from the other angles. And pancreation, of course, uh, Greek, sort of Greek fighting sport. Um, this is a Roman copy of, I believe, a uh, bronze that existed. And I, I don't know if it exists anymore. And I believe that the heads were actually carved later. Uh, and then, and then, sort of um, stuck on, or something like that. Um, so it's a it's a piece that's had sort of adaptation. But then again, what do you expect? I mean, it's, it's damn old. <laughs> um, but it's um, I think it's a wonderful. I, I really think it's a wonderful work uh, compositionally. Um, but then, of course, if you if you hone down to the details, I mean, this, the dominant figure's on top. He's a, he's clenching his fist. He's about to throw a punch by the looks of things into the ribs. Of the, um, of the figure that's you know probably about to submit, and you've you know the the anatomy is absolutely on point. This this thing is you know it's carved from marble. The sensuality of the stone is there. It's very very refined, and it's it's a truly it's a tr truly gorgeous piece of sculpture, I think. Um, but it, it captures that struggle and it captures that freeze frame. And that's what I like. It's like that freeze frame struggle of, of you can, again, you look at that piece of work, you can hear a crowd 
you can you can imagine the sweat on these figures their their mm. struggle their fight what they're what they're engaged in um now this stuff talks to me no J just on the the subject itself obviously the the, the kind of pancreation is one of the uh, most popular greek uh, greeks greek sports they would have it at the olympic games but also the right. Pythi the pythian games as well um and the actually the 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 rules for the pancreation come down to us today i, I remember this very vividly uh, where it's kind of like you can basically do anything you're allowed to punch but you can't kick in the groin and there's no biting that's the, that's the two <laughs> the two rules basically and obviously everyone would be uh -huh. naked sorry oh no that's fascinating because i actually thought i read somewhere a while ago that you could kick the groin but i must be wrong but yeah okay so i didn't realize that yeah. well it, it, maybe that's just for the olympics because i think they sometimes have house okay. house house rules depending on where, <laughs> like which uh, city state you're in right but uh, um but obviously yeah and they and they would wrestle naked and there would be like an elder with a big stick next to them that's right um, um kind of like either w like hitting you for, <laughs> for for breaking the rules or for scoring right. scoring points uh, it's worth it's worth yeah. checking out some kind of Greek vases because uh, they have there's some great yes. depi depictions of this as well. So um, yeah, but ju just to the artistry itself, I mean, it's obviously an amazing piece of piece of work. Uh, Extraordinary. I, th this this right hand here again, it, there is an elegance and a beauty to it, even though it's Brilliant. been twisted and contorted. And just think about. I just feel bad for the reference model that <laughs> that, <laughs> that uh, would have inevitably. It's probably some kind of poor slave. Having this oh, arm, yeah. tw arm twisted for a couple of hours while the uh, I know can can, can you imagine that? And the guy says, "Look, hold still. I need yeah. you to hold that pose." And he's thinking, <laughs> "Fuck." <laughs> but, yeah, but um, you know, the this is a, a true a true a true masterwork and uh, amazing. I, I often amazing. think just uh, just how many you know we're blown away with the few things that survive. You know, it, pro it was a true a true golden age. For aesthetic, oh, aesthetic beauty incredible. and uh, yeah, incredible, yeah. Really. Now, now, obviously, struggle is like the most topically ready, but I wanted to include some of your your new newer stuff that you're working on, and oh, yeah. um, ju just some of some of these uh, some of these pieces that I thought were really cool, really cool, and as as a, as partly as a teaser for people to kind of show show the process and get them excited about some of the stuff you've been working on. So, uh, obviously, it's been very busy with some of the home life recently but you're you're back in the studio working working hard and um this is the kind of stuff these are the kind of maquettes you were mentioning yeah so I'm, i mean i'm working on a number of different maquettes now uh, i'm working on about eight currently in my studio um where i'm basically dreaming of the next works the next monumental works in stone in bronze um and this again yeah it's true it harks back to you know this idea of wrestling it's a takedown it's a tackle um, but it, for me, it's more than that. It's two forces coming into connection. You've got the dominant figure that is, it's smashing through, it's annihilating the other figure. And you've got this, you know, you, you've, you've got this force on his head and I really wanted to capture it. It's almost like this, it's almost like a meteorite and mm. he, he's, his head and, 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 and his forms on the head are kind of um in relief they're not they're not fully in total three dimension they're in a kind of a relief and he's going from the three dimension into this kind of relief and i'm at the moment i'm looking at art deco artists like lee laurie who was an amazing um sculptor um during the american art deco period and he did, um, for example, he, if pe people are aware, he, he did the um, Atlas figure uh, in, in front of the Rockefeller Center. Right, and then yes. a number of different reliefs and stuff like that. So I'm beginning at this point in time now, I'm starting to look at other styles. This is a sketch. This is, um, this is very much just sort of like roughing out of an idea. Um, it's still got plenty of hours to work on it where I'll start bringing in uh, further stylization and, and, and further um, refinement of the forms. But the general composition is starting to come together. You've, um, you know, and, and and I'm looking at, you know, it's it's really this kind of visual and 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 an aesthetic question of saying, how can you kind of blend together um, elements of 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 what made Art Deco strong, but elements of also what made Futurism strong, and finding this 
for lack of a better word, this kind of classical modernism in, in, in some respects, but that's still forward looking in a glorious way. No, not progressive in that idea that people often say, oh, yeah, you, you know, progression leads to degeneracy. Why can't you have progression that leads to gloriousness, that you actually progress out of the dark age? Where it's like we've degenerated in something. Now let's progress into something glorious and strong. So I'm I'm looking not so far back, but you don't have to look far back to still find that glory and that fire. You can see it in the Art Deco period. You can see it in Italian futurism. You can see it in early modernism of of Bordel, um, the great French uh, sculptor. And it's it's these are these are kind of like my early essays. I'm I'm, I'm trying things out. I'm pulling ideas together. Let's see where it goes. It might totally change in a week or two, but I wanted to share a little bit of the process with everyone to see how a small model informs visually my my works and how they progress forward and stuff like that. Mm. I mean, I mean, I particularly love this 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 view across here. It's just like you said, the, like the meteorites. You got the kind of forms you're trying to put on across here, and again, I, I think the head and the, the arm is particularly beautiful. Really, really nice. Work. I was going to ask: yeah. do, you, do you use a, a ligature, uh, you know, like a supporting framework for your work? No. Or do you all all free? So you've got to, total mobility then. Okay. Yeah. yeah ju ju just to yeah, just to give a basic idea, this was actually based on on Matthew the Stoat's drawing because I've been dreaming with Matthew, and um, he's known as Stoatly Stoat on Twitter. It's it's important that I shout him out because he's he's kind of been firing these different drawings at me. I, I mean, you will have probably seen some of our conversations, but. We, we've been having this discussion of like, you know, I'll put something forward, he does a drawing, and we sort of, we're both in this. We're, we're both kind of like trying to find this, this next kind of, where could it go? Where could, where could the next visuals, where could the painting, where could the drawing, where could the sculpture go? What could be interesting as fertile ground to experiment with? That's not sentimental and soppy, but has some real, you know, some real power in it. And um, the arm and the face and the head of this have started to to have a kind of uh, more refined stylization appear in it. There's so much wrong with this, but you can at least begin to see the essence of what this could turn into, of what this might go towards. So yeah. yeah, I think it's important to sometimes show these. No, I, I thought it was great, and it re again it reminded me of that uh, the Greco Greco Roman wrestling, because again it's all about taking your opponent off off their feet, and this this is what the guy yeah. is doing right now. He's about to. Uh, destroy him and uh, <laughs> win win his uh, wreath of uh, victory. And yep. speaking of the Romans, again, I mean, you don't get segues like this on any other uh, uh, any other stream here. We've got our, our sixth uh, pick, and it's this rather interesting. I'd never seen this before. Uh, little kind of bronze work of a gladiator. Yeah, and this little bronze work. I mean, I. Um, I don't know if people know, but I attend a number of different art fairs and I'm constantly on the search to see, you know, sculpture and, and relatively high level art. I mean, I'm, um, you don't see it on the ground level in terms of going to, um, you know, your standard exhibition these days. But if you attend art fairs like like Bruffer, which is the Brussels art fair, or if you attend um, art fairs like TFAF, which is the Maastricht art fair, which is which is really world level, world top. You will see, and this is this is stuff that I've seen. Um, these wonderful little, uh, again, bronzes, venerations, um, uh, small offerings um, of these sculptures that represent different archetypes or different things from that time. Of course, this is a gladiator. Um, he's helmeted. He's very primitive looking. He's geometric in some respects. It's very direct. But look at the energy and the power in it. It haunts you. It, it it draws you in. There's intrigue. It was made from a place that wasn't. It wasn't overly planned. This is organic. It's grown. It's come out of the of the artisan, and you want to look at it. You want to touch it. I've touched these things. I've I've admired these things close up. They speak to me, and there's such a spirit to these works. It's it's it is a kind of spiritual thing because. You can feel the energy running through these things when you're in front of them, hmm. and they're just they're just wonderful, and they're adorned with these small little details. And you see these, um, you know, the reference to the armor, or you see these small little lines, and it's it's very primitive. Well, primitive is maybe the wrong word, but it's it's very human, very direct, 
And it's not mm. trying to correct itself. It's not trying to be too um, absolute, but it's all but there. It's, yes, it's, it's just the amplification of certain things, like I said. like uh, And again, I think when we think about traditional art, again, like the last piece was literally like the, the, the top end of of you know Greek bronzes, but the vast majority of the work that we're producing would be household gods, um, you know, uh, mirrors, small like um, um, you know like works that would be used on a day to day basis, cauldrons, et, et, et cetera. So there's this huge swathe of designers and artists and artisans, artisans, that, yes, that that would be producing these kind of works. And and again, it, like again, maybe it does not have the um, <clears throat> the accurate forms of the human body displayed in the most beautiful way, like the previous work. But there is, mm -hmm. without doubt, something to this work and a fierceness and an energy to it that's been a refined. Charm. Yeah, yeah it is exactly. It's, it's a very charming piece and something that, you know, st like you said, st stays with you. Um, and uh, yeah, it certainly captivated me. Um, the kind of, I, I guess, the, the, the piece that I thought was most similar was uh, another shielded work. Um, or, um, defense. Do you want to give us a little bit of an introduction to this? Yeah. So this this piece is is a um, it's like a direct celebration of these these types of works. Um, you see them through the Greeks, the Romans, um, these small little bronzes. But it's it's a it's a kind of I'm grabbing at those things and I'm firing them forward, and I'm applying this geometricization. Um, that I very much enjoy, which is this refined uh, lines and, and, and ge geometry to a figure. Um, and I'm and I'm looking to kind of, um, you know, if you look at it musically, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm trying to make, I'm trying to tune the instruments of these forms. And I'm trying to just make a very uh, harmonious and um, very kind of direct and balanced work um, while playing with these geometric forms and stuff like that. And you can see it's a figure with a, with a with a, with a shield, but it went beyond that for me because then there was like this this idea of because I like monumental work and I like making monumental work. I thought to myself, what happens if I could contact military bases, and what I'm saying if if I could perhaps make some work that would um, that would talk to a military base in terms of like a defense a defense monument. So you have this mm. this archetype of defense. So I call it defense. It's this archetype of if you were to make this huge. And to make it large, it's a figure with a shield. It's an armored figure with a shield. It harks back through time, but it's eternal. What is the shield? Is it a riot shield? Could be. You know, it's it's like you're looking back, you're looking forward. It's eternal. It sits in a timeless place, at least for me. And I like, I sort of fantasized on this idea of, I'd love to make some monuments for like military bases or, 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 or like even just like military uh, structures or something like that. Um, and this this piece of work actually uh, was exhibited in an exhibition I did called Monumentality, which was the exploration into being able to have a very small piece of sculpture. But it's the concept of monumentality, meaning a piece of sculpture can also be monumental, but it's monumental in the mind. The magic happens in the mind. Sometimes you you can be very excited by a piece of work and you can say, but I can see it big. I can see it. I can see it beyond its scale that it currently resides in. And that was something that I was playing with and I was interested in um, at that time. Um, Moore spoke about the, mon the monumental or the monumentality of certain small sculptures because it's the magic of the mind and it's the imagination. You can imagine some small things huge. At least I, it's, it's, it's almost like a childlike thing. I used to have that a lot when I was a kid. I would look at small stuff and kind of imagine it absolutely huge. Imagine, this, imagine these large structures. And that was something that I was fantasizing about with... Um, some of these works. It's, it's also instilling a, a sort of a distilled power into a small mm. piece. Mm. There's, there's something really interesting there as well about, you mentioned about like, um, what would the figure of defense look like? You know, this allegorical figure. And again, what something the, the was that the like Renaissance period was really interested in was again, trying to say, you know, what, uh, what does music look like? Like what is the like the figure of music or the figure of luxury or the figure of sloth or whatever, but yes, you know, you know could, could you know this is an exploration of creating a new pantheon of alle allegorical figures and yeah you should definitely revisit defense in in a in a different and new form you know trying to uh, to build and evolve uh, defense.
defense more as a, as a as yeah. a character you know i think that's that's very cool the, 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 other, the other thing i want to say is that you know obviously defense is something passive but you've still managed to get motion to it and again it's all about the kind of leaning forward so there's, there's something yeah. yeah the juxtaposition of um yeah go, going forward to defend you know so well in, in 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 so much of my work i have this forward motion because it's for me it's like i i, I had this story that started to tell I have this thing while I'm making work, a story will play in my mind. And I had this story playing over in my mind while making, uh, you know, this series of work. And it was always because all the figures were always looking forward. Faces were looking forward. Things were marching forward. And I had this idea of like, well, yeah, you know, you, you defend the ground that's behind you. You've got that ground, but you have to keep moving forward and you have to keep looking forward. But you march forward with, 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 with that intensity and that fire. You carry the fire forward. You don't leave it there. It goes out. You have to take it forward. And it's and 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 so that's why so many of these figures are looking forward. It's it's that, that eternal looking, because I am looking forward. And it's not in this in this soppy sense of to progress. It's in this glorious sense of because you've got to keep going. You know, you can't stagnate. You've mm. got to keep moving forward. And you know, to defend something, you can't just stand there. You also have yeah. to actually get out there and move. And it's you've got to be dynamic in the defense too. Otherwise yeah, exactly. you'll just get you'll get, you know, hammered. No, for sure. Okay, on to on to our last pair. And it's uh I saved some of the best to last. So yes, uh Umberto Boccioni's Boccioni's unique forms of continuity in space. Uh yeah. I, I mean it's a work that many people would have seen, but maybe do you want a, another little quick intro? Yeah, this this piece <sighs> again has burnt itself deeply into my mind uh, when i was at the academy we were doing um very sort of realistic sculptures of n nudes figures um you know f f figures that were just you know naked and it was it was an interesting practice um but i felt at, at a certain point i you know i was looking, i was looking at this work alongside and, and sort of parallel and i just thought man i just want to i want to see figures I want to see figures moving. I want to see this life and I'm getting tired of this sentimentality. And, and so this, these sorts of work spoke to me. Um, and the thing that, the thing that I love about this work that Boccioni made was that for its time, previous to this, you had figures, you have, you have Rodan's uh, man, he's moving forward. Um, and, 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 and it's an implied movement. You've got other figures that are moving forward or stepping forward. And you see that throughout time even in the Greeks and the Egyptians, stuff like that. But the thing is, is what, what Boccioni has captured is he's captured the metaphysical. He's captured energy. He's captured fire. He's captured the fire of a soul moving forward. It's not a physical man moving forward. It's a man on fire. It's a man who is possessed with a strength, a sort of a spiritedness. And he's marching forward with absolute glory and divine energy. In my eyes, this is, this is what I was seeing when I saw this piece. And it's there and he's in motion and it's, Again, it's 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 kind of like it's come out of a portal. Where the hell did this come from? <laughs> the thing is, is, is when people look at this piece, you have these you have these more sort of like trad, faux trad traditionalist types, dusty, dusty sorts of individuals. They'll look at this and they'll say, oh, it's not this and that. It doesn't have the charm of this and that. And I say to my, uh, you know, I say to them, I'm thinking to myself, I challenge you, anyone, try to make a figure at that complexity that works. It's got a balancedness. It's got a it's got a, um, a compositional power and strength. Look at the flecks of fire and flame that are coming off that figure. They're all playing there. It's music. It's music playing to the to the spatial composition of what Boccioni's genius has allowed that to be. Not every person can do that. It's a glorious piece of work. It, 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 for me, it, it it has enchanted me. It's bewitched me. Mm. Just on a bit of background about uh, the guy himself. He had a bit of a background, uh, like tied into the impressionist movement before, kind of tying himself with the uh, the futurists and a few, a few others. Um, but again, the futurists are all about um, showing kind of movement in different stages. So again, a, yeah. a curse, like an initial glance, you may think that this is about showing multiple movements. But you know, Fern, I think your analysis of this is is really true because these lines and curved forms don't look like um, a calf in motion this these do look like um like fire or 
um, yes. s- s- something or again ar- armor pieces or some- something like that yes. so, again it's it's beyond uh, comprehension and so um but it and, and again even the pose from the side it looks like a, a stride but the legs i think are too tight for a stride it almost feels like a lunge in some ways you know like yeah. a yeah. Uh, like a, a fences uh a fences lunge so it, it, there is something kind of mythical to it. It's, I, I almost yeah. think it's, it reminds me of um, like a Byzantine, like iconic work or something like that. There's a mystery, yeah. a, a mystery and incomprehensibility to it. So we're seeing the the face of an angel walking or something like that. You know. Well, so, yeah. You, you actually the way you the way you've just put it is wonderful because what what it brings me to is it's it's an eternal work. It resides in the eternal realm. And few works can do that. You see it through the, the canon of, 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 of European great art. Um, they reside in, a, in in eternal realm. And this is certainly one that resides in the modernist eternal realm. It will echo through the ages and it will echo down through the ages. And I think this, this piece will go on to inspire others. It's certainly inspiring me. It's echoing through me. As I said, I'm walking through the ghosts of uh, these great um, artists, and certainly Boccioni, who died young, fortunately. No, um, it's, it's so tragic, you know. So, again, it's it's a, it's big big boots to fill, and also this is going to be the hardest ever <laughs> pairing because we you know we've bigged up to that that piece so much for now <laughs> know. that you know it's God, an, yeah. an, eter- an eternal work. But uh, you know, yeah. I, I I thought one of the pieces that had as much energy or as much power as that was uh, was Breakthrough. But um, what's your what's your thoughts on the piece? And uh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I it's true there was a very clear line of inspiration from um, Boccioni's work. I wanted to capture this this figure that was again in a process of marching, but I wanted to put a um, a symbol in the figure's arms and hands, um, and it's a flag. It's not a flag that has any. Um, you know, distinction to it, but it's, you know, what I found interesting is that at the head of any marching army is the flagman mm. who marches with the flag. He is the beating heart of that army. He's the beating heart of that uh, movement. And I wanted to capture that on an archetypal sense as well and celebrate that. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a big, it's big, um, you know, it's a big honor to carry the flag. Yeah, and... I, I, I was just going to say that I think I think we've lost the importance of the flag. I, I love like the Napoleonic ideas of it, where you know the standard has been the the, the eagle banner has been kissed by Napoleon himself. You know, yes. you've got that yes. connection to your lord, absolutely. And, and, and to lose that is a huge humiliation, and to gain the enemies is a you know hugely like a an amazing an amazing uh, amazing act. So yeah, it's. It's a it's almost like a totem, you know. It's like this yes. kind of p- powerful spiritual force on the battlefield. Absolutely, and it's a metaphysical force on the battlefield because okay, it's a flag, and people say, "Well, it's just a flag," and you're like, "No, it's a hell of a lot more than that." And it's the flag bearer and what he's doing and what he's engaged in. It was a fascinating thing for me, but it's the flag bearer in motion, in movement. He marches across the. He marches into another land. He marches into another realm. And he's followed by the army and he's the spirit of the army. And I wanted to capture that in this figure, which, which I called breakthrough. I called it breakthrough because it's like breaking through the lines, but it's more than that. It's, uh, it's pushing over into the boundaries of the unknown. And it's a conversation with myself. It's a conversation with other sculptors and artists. Um, it's this idea of like, again, <laughs> Along with the manifesto, it's a rallying cry um, in pretty much in the darkness. It's shouting into the darkness of saying, look, guys and girls, um, we need to we need to really uh, roll forward. And um, it's, it's, it's again, it's a wish. Sculpture for me is a wish. Um, you make this thing. You want to connect with others. You want to see if other people feel what you're what you're you know, trying to get out there. Um, it's, you know. On, on, it, it's on many different levels for me. This piece of work, it's it's a very it's a very uh, it's emotional work for me. Um, yeah. So so yeah, I'm rambling. 
No, 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 I, I like it. And he, and he did it in bronze as well. So, is it, so this this is the version in um, in stone. Yeah, and then yeah, you could... the bronze version. Yeah, no, yeah. So I, I this was made out of a um, a very large piece of stone. Uh, it was a serious thing to tackle. Um, it was it's a loving Jean. It's also a it's a French limestone. Wonderful stone to carve in. It's extremely brutal. You find bits of um, fossil in there, which is which is really, really, really uh, fascinating to see. Actually, you see different sort of shells and fossils in there. Um, you also have, um, yeah, a series of other different hard stones. So it makes it a very brutal carve because you'll meet areas of soft stone, you'll meet areas of hard stone, and if you screw up, um, you'll lose large sections of the stone. So it certainly wasn't an easy task, but it was a labor of love. And I pushed through and, you know, it it, it 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 all came together. It's a figure carrying a flag. And I wanted to capture this sort of plenular motion. And it's like this idea of, you know, he's he, he's moving forward or he's, or he's at a motion of rest. He's about to move forward. Um, but all of the different plenular motions and the plenular um, sort of forms that I've captured on him sort of paint this. Is it armor? Is it clothing? It's something moving on him. He's alive. He's about to. He's about to step forward, or he's stepping forward, and you know, or he's standing ground. It's 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 all of those things coming together for me. Hmm. Well, yeah, I, I love it. There's there's something about the heroic about it, but again, it could be like um, it's it's almost remind me of Hercules a little bit, you know, because he he was he's also known as the the club man, you know, who'd always be, t be t depicted with <laughs> like right. a large a large club, and yes, his followers. His fo his followers would uh, would wear clubs as like a symbol of protection on their on their journeys across through you know bandit territory, but yeah you know he, he, this is a, this is a heroic figure that we're seeing yes. right now. Yeah. Um, and again, I, I like this idea of reengaging with heroic ideas because it like they must be you have to yeah. And, and but then like going back to kind of commissioning etc. You know I think it's really interesting because. What it, it certainly, I don't know if, how much you know about what's been commissioned in England recently. Like, if I look at the, the last six sculptures I can think of, it's things like the Wind, Windrush Memorial or it's a, the yeah. Diana, Diana sculpture. It's yeah. all, it's, it's all like just, just dis disregarding the, the quality of the pieces themselves. Open brackets, they're terrible. Yeah. Um, the, the idea of uh, allegorical figures being used or figures that represent what what the people believe in or feel ha has has sort of gone uh, in, oh, yeah. in england so like in victorian yeah. times that you you would have a figure of you know like here is strength or here, here is like industry or you know here is boating or, or whatever yes. so i i would love to see a return where the nation cries out for you know what what does what how do we see ourselves as heroes or how do we see ourselves as as great men, men in our time and to have that yeah. depicted um, well the, yeah i mean that, that that's it, you know it's, it's great to hear you hear you mention that it, just the heroic in as a principle is has been extinguished because of course the heroic steps on or steps into areas that are not quite um you know, uh, sweet and friendly um, to the establishment. So, um, you know, they, they, they don't really want that kind of stuff. They don't want people connecting to the heroic, actually. And art does connect you to that. Um, and, um, you know, it, it, you now need to show the oppressed. You can't show the hero because the hero is obviously there oppressing something or someone mm, or a principle yeah. of that. Um, so there's this, there is this, there is this spiritual warfare going on in the art world. I see it on a commissioned level. I see it on a, um, you know, just like an exhibition level. Um, you know, it's, 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 it, it, it's fascinating when you go in and the further you dig, you, you understand that there's a, there's a spiritual, uh, there's, uh, well, the spiritual warfare going on really. Um, but, but yeah, nothing really is, is, is kind of there to uplift or really to, to, to celebrate something. Um, so yeah, I mean, you, you get it, Pharaoh, you know, exactly where we are. Yeah. Well, let's, let's leave it at that for tonight. But, um, fair, fair enough. I just want to say that out of all of the artists I, I've kind of seen or spoken to, I, I think you've got, um, a genuine body of work. And again, I, I just want to emphasize that I've, I see so many, I don't want to be mean to them 
dabblers, uh, sketchers or doodlers, people that um, will create, again, technically accurate works or one-off pieces. But you need to be bigger than that. You need to have, again, a collection or a body of work that kind of shows uh shows you you know shows what you're about and and again i think you know people can fault fault you for many reasons Sven, but they cannot like you've done the work you know what i'm saying you've you've got uh a serious and um you you know you can you can think it's good or bad but you cannot deny it's there so i just want to say hats hats off again for for uh some excellent work and um hopefully that's that's showing the audience um you know yeah i mean i mean being inspired so yeah, thanks so much for having me on, Ferro. I mean, it's 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 great to be able to throw these ideas out there, and it's it's true as you say that there will always be people who will fault you, and there'll always be people who will say, "Look, you're not doing the kind of work that I want to see." And um, as I've mentioned many times before, I thrive within the realm of you love me or you hate me. If you hate me, that's great. If you love me, that's glorious. Um, I don't want to be in between. I don't want to be the guy that's ah, oh, I can sort of take it or leave it. You love it or you hate it. That's fine. If you if you hate my work, come and tell me why on Twitter. If you love it, come and tell me why. You know, I'm always up for a discussion. I'm always up for a bit of a uh, uh, you know fight. <laughs> um, and it's and it's something that is um, you know it's important. If if you don't love my work, then find artists out there who are doing the work that you want them to do and support them. That's the important thing. You have to find the artists that you love and buy their work and support them. That's that's how we're going to have a flourishing culture and a flourishing art um, world is we're going to need to have um, support from all kinds of different angles and different areas. And we can really start growing an organic movement. I, I want there to be in the art world. I want there to be more classically based artists who are really doing the foundational uh, classical c- kind of stuff. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and I, will, I will constantly prod them and call them dusty, but that's fine. And they'll constantly attack me. And, and you know, we'll have this backwards and forward uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, dialectic that goes on. Yes, yeah, yeah, dialectic. Um, but that's what needs to happen in, a, in, a, in, a, in an art world that's, that's, that's true and not, mm. um, not what we currently have today, which is, well, as you're aware, and I'm sure as the listeners are aware, uh, is a kind of manufactured, um, zombified nonsense. Yeah. There's there's something about I think the power of envy in art that that we've sort of lost because it's it's such a love and nowadays you know you you can't hate or be envious of any of anyone else but back in the day you know um, you know um, you know Dura was envious of Titian when he went to see him yes. you know or was it like was it Michelangelo and uh, He's the guy that punched him in the nose or whatever. You, you, you know, it's 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 the it's the eternal thing where what what, what we want to see is lots of great artists, be they you know like you said classically inspired or not, um, yeah. and then to 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 hate like again bring the hate, bring the envy because that's what makes great uh, great work. So um, it's 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 so important. It's it's so important, and it, it's really important that the artists are also disagreeing with each other and fighting. Um, you know, it's something that I speak with Matthew the Stoat about. It's like, you should have those moments where as an artist, you see something on Twitter, you call them out, you say, look, your work doesn't, it's not there. And there's a, there's a sort of a conversation that in, unfolds from there. You know, it's not all this sort of like, oh, patting on the back. Oh, you've done very good work. Well done. You know, um, it, it, that there, there, there should also be those moments of like, wow, what the hell is this? This is total dross. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. J- just kind of rounding up with, with, uh, sh- chilling you know if you do happen to own a small mansion and you're looking for a monumental work for the garden please please contact <laughs> Fen directly and commission him something but e- e- even if you are a, a penniless neat <laughs> as Fen's <laughs> learned about just you, you could just th- throw Fen a follow on Twitter and to, and yep. uh, I'm sure he would appreciate that and uh, absolutely you know it's, let's let's light some fires under the right people and have some fun you know uh, any 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 last words Sven? What, what what what's what's next you know more 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 stuff have you got any shows coming up or anything like that at all or uh, just, it's, it's well all... i mean i i currently have another um i i have a, a show running right now where i've just got a series of works um that is being displayed in a sculpture garden 
Um, but that will be coming to an end soon. Um, but my next, really my next shows, um, I will only be looking to really get organized when I've, when I've really got this next body of work put together. Um, it's going to take a bit of time. Um, and I really want to nail this next series. I think it has to be absolutely right on. Um, I want to, you know, I want to continue to evolve. So the work has to grow stronger. It has to grow, um, you know, it has to, it has to have a, a, you know, an even more refined energy into it. So it's, it's, it's pushing myself further. Um, mm. You know, it's, it, it, it's trying to also develop this next language and go and go beyond what I've done before, because I think, I think what's important for an artist is that you continue to evolve. You don't just sit within one certain style. You also evolve and you go beyond that and you keep challenging yourself and you keep marching forward, um, you know, and, 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 and developing yourself. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Well, thank you so much. And um, we'll see you soon on the Ferry Channel. Goodbye. Cheers. Thank you.